so we'll be doing both uh, panel um, discussions where you'll see uh, uh, the main person on the screen and then we'll have in di di different discussions as we um, as you'll see a screen on like like we see here with everybody um, you are um, if you don't feel comfortable being on video you know feel free to hop in on and off we love to see all your faces we love to see all your reactions all your smiles um, but you know feel comfortable with 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 whatever you have at the moment um, please take a bit of breaks as you need to we, we are on for about three hours and so we'll have little um, music breaks and poetry breaks and and bring in this form um, one of the pieces that that Greg and I um, wanted to make sure is that there are many forms to to create climate action right and and many times we we see policy and we see kind of these spaces as as the main one, but also bringing in sort of the visual aspects of climate action was extremely important. And so we'll have um, some pieces on online sharing some of their works, some of their um, awesomeness, some of their songs, some of their poetry. Um, and then we'll have those uh, videos. Uh, Greg has spent some time um, recording folks and ensuring that their voices are, are said. So if, if we can't, um, we won't be able to have everybody online, but, but Greg was out recording and making sure that those intersections are shared through video. And so it'll be kind of a little bit of everything. Um, and I think that's about it for, for some of the agreements and some of the intentions. You know, we want folks to have a deep conversation. So if you have any questions, any thoughts, you know, feel free to, to privately um, uh, uh, leave a message on Greg or myself or Vane um, for any questions that you have. If you don't feel comfortable dropping them in the chat, um, any links, things like that, we'll make sure to share them through chat. And overall, want to have a good discussion um, and want to get to um, some next steps. And so, want to hear from a lot of the great people. So, I'll pass it on to Greg to kind of share a little bit more about some of the framework for this conversation. Cool. Thank you, Diana. And I think I got a message that Maria is here with us. So um, we're going to do another juggle here on the front end and make sure we get their time because I'm, I'm just something I'm really excited to be sharing. Uh, I think we have a lot to learn from each other here in San Antonio. We have a lot to learn from those who have, uh, moved, who have moved forward in some struggles out of necessity in other parts of the country. So uh, I'm glad. Uh, welcome. Um, and, and I think what I wanted to offer up front is really, uh, I wanted to read through, and I don't know if you have uh, Vanessa access, Bonnie, the, uh, the letter, the open letter PDF. Uh, I can bring it up on my screen or do a share screen if you don't uh, have that in the folder. Looking for it now. Okay, um, should be in the same. Essentially, okay. this this is a conversation that uh, has grown out of about four months. I'd say over the last four months, there's a group of there's a group of um, uh, uh, organizations, individuals who have been leading and really advocating around climate action in San Antonio since 2017. I'm just going to back end it there. Obviously, folks have been doing this work a long time here. Um, but specifically at that point, coming into uh, into a coalition, um, and uh, the the first kind of big movement for that group was to uh, create a climate action plan or to support demand the the creation of one. And I know Doug Melnick, who's on the call with us right now, I'm sure that was a good moment. I mean, I know you've been advocating within government, and then here comes a big push kind of motivated by Trump pulling out of the Paris Accord uh, uh, or starting that process. Um, and um, let's see, if you can scroll down to the first page, I'm just going to read along with you. And so we created over about, you know, we got that done, we got the plan, um, and we've been waiting kind of like a year to start seeing things come together, and, and, and they will be over the next couple of months. Doug will update us on that. Um, but we, we kind of like the groups, many of us decided to stay together, even though that was our key objective to, to push forward in the work, you know, we wanted to hold the table together and, 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 you know, maintain that, the, the forward movement. Uh, and so this was an open letter that was delivered to Mayor Nuremberg, to the city council, to the board of uh, trustees at CPS Energy, uh, just recognizing, you know, hey, San Antonio is, you know, we're a big city, we're, we're, we're an awesome city, we got good people here. 
um, but we're also historically the most economically and racially segregated large cities uh, among the large cities in the United States. Um, and COVID, you know, everybody kind of like COVID hit and we're like, oh, wow, we've got trouble. We've got structural trouble um, in San Antonio. Uh, and it, like, you know, we were shocked. Uh, and, 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 with, and with commitments um, uh, to, to not go back. We heard this a lot, I think, in, in communities all around the country that we're not going to go back. We can't go back to that same kind of like uh, uh, inequities that we had before, uh, race and class-based inequities. Uh, and on the next page, uh, we talk about... Um, you know, that, that we could have seen this, you know, we could have predicted this, and that the, the, the contributors here, uh, including everything from, you know, air pollution, uh, from, you know, our coal plant, right, our power, how we generate power, our transportation networks, lack of green space and healthy food, redlining, and racist development patterns, uh, policing, and, and, and on and on. And the next page, um, while we recognize some of this forward movement with the climate plan, for instance, which is probably by my read, I was on the steering committee on, as that was developed, is probably the most equity rich language of any climate plan that I'm aware of. There's one or two that have like kind of like an appendix and, and Doug can maybe check me on this, but there's, it's just, it's just it, it has a lot of promise in that language uh, that really is gonna require on the community to, to um, make sure that we can realize together um, on the next page, just saying that the council has uh, declared racism a public health threat, um, but what's the action? What's the next steps? Where, where does it go? And nobody's looking at CPS Energy. It's the largest contributor to our general fund. You know, 30% uh, of our entire city's general fund comes from CPS Energy. Um, but there's a, there's a kind of a, a deep incuriosity among our city council to, to kind of challenge or to look at the way we generate power, who pays for that power, uh, unrecorded costs and, and the like. Uh, and so in, in here we, we developed, I guess, two pages forward, the demands. This is a really a summation and I'm gonna put into the chat uh, the full, um, at some point, I think I, yeah, the full one is at climateactionessay.com. Uh, I'm gonna find that and drop that into the chat in a minute. Um, but essentially, the, the first part was about the disconnects. We, we uh, like utilities around the country, went into a period where we hit a pause button. The utility said, okay, we're not going to cut people off while we're in crisis. Um, we keep waiting. You know, we've been in a 30-day you know, holding pattern, you know, waiting to see when they're going to start that again, month to month, you know, uh, as debt accumulates. Uh, and so one of our demands was like, no more, you know, give us at least, you know, plan out till February. Just say like, you know, for the next four months, you know, no more. Uh, following that, our, our next demand was eliminate disconnects altogether uh, for those at 200% of the poverty level and below. Uh, we came to see uh, disconnections, you know, something that it was almost like you don't see the water until you fall out of the, the, the tank, right? And you're trying to get back in, into uh, to breathe, you know, for fish, the fish among us. Um, but we were we did an open records request uh, with CPS and they were cutting off power to over uh, 50, 60, 70, and in, in one year, 100,000 homes and businesses per year, 50,000 on average in the summer months of June, July, and August. Uh, and we, you know, you, you look at that and, you know, with this new, you know, sharpness of COVID, I guess, and you just see an inhumanity in that. And it's something that we aren't willing to tolerate anymore. There's uh, also, you see weatherization opportunities within CPS. They have some forward-looking, community-looking programs that we want to see unpacked. Uh, and that is something uh, that we've been advocating for within the Sierra Club. And uh, I'm going to put a, a document uh, in the chat on that um, to make sure folks can, are interested where uh, that has been, where that conversation has been. Um, oh, say by the interpretation. Uh, I don't know if we made that announcement. If anybody needs a Spanish language interpretation, uh, Seba Ivi, my friend is here with us. Um, I guess contact Vanessa, the speak, the, uh, who's run, doing the run of show. Um, and uh, anyway, so down on this and all the way down to shutting down Spruce. And so there is a campaign right now as well. There's a petition gathering campaign that would force this if we can't get it, you know, through this policy setting process, um, getting it on the ballot uh, for next May and getting that voted up that will shut Spruce down uh, by 2030. So I wanted to share that. And the last page is our, our list of, of, of signatories on that. It's a couple dozen groups. Uh, maybe half are within this coalition I was talking up about before, um, and um, uh, others who have joined us uh, since. So let me see where I am. Um, I just want to say quickly, it's 2.20. 
Uh, we're going to juggle a little bit. I think we're going to push this video back where it belongs uh, on the mutual aid video. Um, what I what I was hoping, so this letter kind of prompted, one, made us want to do a big conversation to to open it up, to bring in guests from from outside of our community, from meet new ones from within, uh, and who have really been looking at these issues and thinking about them, um, both within energy justice, within you know equity and theory and practice, the potential for urban urban food systems and public health through this climate lens and climate justice lens. Even as this third wave of COVID, you know, is 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 crashing in Texas right now, we know that our political leaders could do better. We know our communities need them too, and that we ourselves can uh, also step up when we look at the mutual aid uh, response that's been uh, so amazing, uh, which we'll get into in a little bit as well. Um, uh, like uh, my new, I'm going to call her my new friend, but one of the women I, I interviewed. Candy with a group called A Hidden Heart. They just sprung up out of the scene, out of their South Side community and said, there's just a tremendous amount of hunger and the food bank wasn't getting to those people and they were veterans and they couldn't leave their homes or whatever it was. And they've got now 20 volunteers, you know, uh, you know, busing food, you know, con you know around the clock. Um, and, but we, we can see other, you know, policy responses are out there and hopefully more ideas can come in and we can break this letter out even further. Um, that uh, like, you know, at from an international level, I mean, we can just compare with the U European Union, which just committed $550 billion over the next seven years to green projects. And that's on top of another 70, 50 uh, billion dedicated to virus recovery and, and everything else in their budget. Um, there's, a, there's a provision that even if it's not earmarked a green project, it can do no harm, right? To people and the earth and the biosphere. Uh, in the city of Seattle, you know, we can look at the jumpstart progressive revenue tax where, you know, the rich and most wealthiest individuals and businesses in Seattle now have a tax uh, that they're going to be pulling in over $214 million every year to move into recovery work uh, and to assist communities. And that even that's now in, in negotiation about how much of that should be reflected also in drawing out um, from money from the police department, right, in, in the defund movement. Uh, in Texas, there is a very recent report showing that if if we saw recovery money or stimulus funds of 55 billion, we'd see a six-fold increase uh, in in new emerging techno energy technologies of 350 billion uh, right away, uh, and a lot of that too, over two million jobs uh, and uh, re uh, a reduction in energy bills for individuals. Uh, and I'm going to pop that into the chat. And then I think it's interesting. You know, we've been talking a lot in San Antonio. Uh, about, um, I'm having trouble finding on my windows, I apologize, um, about, uh, you know, our aquifer, you know, and taking the aquifer off the ballot and putting in this other Prop B, you know, which is a, a job stimulus, you know, project. Um, uh, and, and while you know, under you know, defunding um, aquifer protection in the greenways, while up in Austin, they're looking at greenway uh, work uh, as a conservation core type model as a recovery work, which is really interesting uh, to me. So we're looking for ideas. We're excited to have everybody in here. Uh, and I'm just going to try to keep, keep short now because uh, I do want to make way. Um, and if Maria, if you're available, uh, Maria Lopez Nunez from the Ironbound Community Corp. Uh, is here to speak more about kind of this broad range of like uh, of these these intersecting crises, whether it's you know toxic incinerators or things in your communities, like we talk about our coal plant, which I've got you know behind me on the screen right here, spruce uh, on the south side of Calaveras Lake, um, uh, how that intersects with public health, food access, you know, uh, 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 and, uh, and uh, uh, racist policing or redlining. Uh, I just would love to turn it over to Maria engage in that conversation. Uh, following that, we've got Doug Melnick with the city of San Antonio. And I just want to make sure uh, that we reach Alfred. Uh, I, I said 245 because I know he's got to be out of here at three. So we may have to play on the end there. Um, but that's kind of like my, my setup. Uh, and I don't know um, if Maria or Deanna, either one, uh, want to pick up from there. If I could just make a quick announcement for the interpretation. Um, si usted necesita traducción en español, um, aquí abajo um, en el círculo, uh, dice uh, interpretation. Uh, ahí puede hacer clic en inglés o en español. Si usted necesita, si tiene um, preguntas, me las puede mandar a mí por el chat o a Vanessa Ramos. Um, and then I think we're ready for Maria. I'm really excited. Hey, hey Indiana, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm Maria, Maria Lopez Nunes, um, and I 
live in Newark, New Jersey, you know, so our organization is the Ironbound Community Corp. We've been around for about 51 years in this community. Um, yeah, and thank you. It's an honor to be invited. You know, being here speaks to the power of relationships in our movement, um, of how we can connect Newark and San Antonio. Um, so that's really exciting for me to be joining you this Saturday, you know. Um, you know, so just to get into it, you know, because I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but in I'll describe my neighborhood a little bit, right? So our neighborhood is four square miles. And we host our state's largest incinerator, garbage incinerator that burns, oh, you know, over a million tons of um, trash from New York City, mostly, <laughs> you know, so it really speaks to that divide. <laughs> Most people have not really heard about the Ironbound, they've heard of New York City, but we, we handle their trash. We're also home to the Newark Airport. Um, which is where most people, when they're coming to the tri-state area, they land in Newark. And then the port of Newark, right, which is where 18% of the consumer goods and New York City is the largest consumer market, not just for the country, but for the world, you know, in, in this small concentrated area. You know, we, we think of ourselves as the beating heart of capitalism. Um, and most of the goods come in through the port of Newark and then to leave out to leave the port of Newark they go through the iron bound on a truck right because the roads cut us off and there's three major roadways if you're heading to New York City or headed out that cut through our neighborhood um you know so it's it's a story that I think is familiar I'm sure right <laughs> to a lot of other communities across the country we also have the longest Superfund site that's 17 miles worth of a Superfund site in our community and that's the Passaic River where during the um, Vietnam War, we were producing Agent Orange. You know, we had the largest factory making Agent Orange and the byproduct dioxin, they were just dumping it into the river. You know, we have fat rendering plants. Uh, we have two um, power plants in our neighborhood. And again, I remind everyone, I'm only, I'm not leaving our four square mile boundary. Um, so that just brings me to our work, right? Our work is, I think, your traditional environmental justice work of trying to fight pollution and and um, dirty industry from coming in here, uh, from continuing to be here. And one of the ways that we have done this um, recently, and we have a, a new win, we managed to pass the country's leading environmental justice bill. And what it is, it's a, a bill that gives our Department of Environmental Protection, that gives the permits for all these toxic facilities, the ability to deny permits on the basis of overburden. So thinking about race and class, you know, so if our, if our census black group is over 40% um, people of color or 40% low income or um, monolingual, you know, non-English speakers, then this protection would kick in where an industry would have to do an, uh, a disproportionate burden assessment to see, do we already have more than maybe our suburban neighbors? And the answer is most likely yes, right? If, you know, thinking about all these things we just named. And in that case, then the department shall, and the words are in there, the, the department shall deny. And somehow this win came, you know, over the summer. It came in the middle of COVID, you know, and we give a lot of credit to Black Lives Matter for that win. It shows that as racial justice is really bubbling to the surface, that we can move some of our, um, of our struggles that our communities have had for such a long time, that we can move them forward, even in the midst of a crisis, you know, because, you know, during the pandemic, our neighborhood, it's just been hemorrhaging. You know, we've had um, landlords who, when people are so vulnerable, have lost their jobs and can't pay rent, they're threatening to call ICE on them, you know, or just emptying people, whole buildings out. And so as we've been pushing for, we won the environmental justice bill. We're also pushing for a housing bill um, to help people have more time to pay back the, pay, pay, pay the rent back um, after the moratoriums have lifted. Because I think you were talking about it, right? Like um, there are moratoriums on like, if, if utilities, we have that too. We have eviction. Well, they're really, they should be called removal moratoriums, right? People can't be removed from the homes. Um, but when you're dealing with our community, sometimes the law doesn't work, right? Like that's why you need organizations that have people's back, that build relationships um, with their communities so that we can defend each other um, 
when people are breaking the laws so that we can help each other learn what the protections are because they keep there's such a changing paradigm every day you know so it's been just amazing with the ej bill to be able to move that forward because in you know even in the midst of pandemic it's important i think for our communities to know that wins are possible you know that not everything is shut down and actually that crisis is a moment for us uh to come out better right that that's the whole principles of just recovery it's not just going back to the status quo it's how do you how do we actually come back and be better so and that's what we're hoping the ej bill does because when we think about disproportionate burdens and deaths as a result of COVID, they're in our communities, and it's by no accident that they're in our communities when you think about the list of industry that pollutes on our communities, right? And so our bill's hoping to address that by stopping any further development, but also as there's renewals, putting conditions. So the bill also has a provision for renewals of permits and how they will be conditioned in order to mitigate um, admissions, mitigate health stressors and impacts from dirty industry that already exists in our community. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not the best timekeeper here, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, that that's like a comprehensive view of like what we're dealing with here. You know, we haven't let up because obviously we also have been working on the Civilian Complaint Review Board in response to everything. Our community has been fighting for that for 60 years, and we lost in the Supreme Court also in the middle of COVID. <laughs> you know, and it just speaks to the burden that community-based organizations have of we can't just respond to one aspect of our members' lives. You know, we need to respond to the wholeness of our members, and that, that means dealing with the environment but also dealing with housing, with dealing with police and immigration, you know, and of course dealing with people's health because all of these things are an impact on health and they stress out our community, you know, like of not being able to pay the bills, looking at the smokestacks in the back and then having asthma attacks and then knowing that COVID is out there and is going to target us worse, um, you know. So I think COVID has been the great magnifier of inequalities in our society and hopefully as we think about just recovery, we the, the, those folks with privilege need to put that aside and then learn to follow the leadership of people that are directly impacted and have a lived day-to-day -day experience with all the things that we talked about. Because I think that that's the only way forward. So if I haven't used up all my time, great. I'll take yeah. a question or two, but I'm not sure how we're doing. Yeah, that. if you can hang with us for a minute, what I think what I'd like to do is we've got Doug up uh, for, for a brief talk. Um, uh, I think uh, Dr. Montoya will be able to complement a bit of what you've been described with our water utility. I was talking about our power utility and cutoffs. Uh, we've got even when it comes to the rates that people are paying and who's paying for like these really growth based kind of uh, uh, development patterns with our water utility, it's people who can't afford to be doing that, you know? Uh, so he's got a great talk. So we'll do, if we can get Doug on, um, get Dr. Montoya in, and then open it up the conversation. And, and, and thank you so much, Maria. I'm so glad that you're here. And, and if we can, and then have the time that we can to talk before we move, just move, just bump up things a little bit. But um, Doug Melnick, I think uh, many of you all know, uh, heads up the Office of Sustainability here. He worked with so many people. There's about 90 people that ultimately were engaged in developing our climate plan for San Antonio. Um, we're not gonna do a whole retrospective of, of, of all that work. It was about two years and uh, probably more prepping, you know, on the front end, um, but uh, it's getting ready to come back to life or re, you know, uh, reappear uh, in the political constellation. And I just wanted to uh, invite you in to talk about one, how equity is, you know, how that is, how that's in the document and, and what we need to do to make sure it's, it's realized. Yeah. Great. And, and thank you. Thank you, Greg. And, and thank you, Deanna, for, for the invitation. And, and, um, you know, I, I think there's major, I mean, there's, there's major issues and I, and I really appreciate hearing, uh, you know, about Newark. I, you know, I, I spent time in Newark. I have friends who worked for the city of Newark in the equity and the environmental justice space. And I, I know that the challenge is to thank you so much for that update. But I'm, I'm, as, as mentioned, I'm Doug Melnick, Chief Sustainability Officer uh, for the city of, of San Antonio. Um, you know, I came, from, came here uh, in, in 2014 from, from upstate New York, where I was uh, Director of Planning and Sustainability for the city of Albany. 
super small city, about 100,000 people in a region of 750,000. So, uh, you know, I was looking to move to a large city and, and work on climate issues. You know, my, I, I, I back then and, and, and even now believe climate is the most important thing that we need to work on just because it's going to exasperate every issue um, that, that we, we face. Uh, when I got to San Antonio, the first thing I did was I went and I met with different city leaders uh, to find out what the priorities were. And climate wasn't one of them. Uh, and, and it was a little disheartening um, because, you know, it, it, it's, we, as we all know on the call, there's not a lot of time to address this. So um, the approach we took was to, to develop the SA Tomorrow Sustainability Plan. Um, uh, that, that was back in 2016. And while not a climate plan, it had a greenhouse gas inventory. It had a climate trends analysis. It had a climate vulnerability um, assessment. It was a start. Uh, and, and the hope was to start you know, raising awareness of the issue. And, and we started getting some thoughts and comments some, from some council members about, well, what is a climate plan? Why don't we have it? But I, I think as Greg had alluded to, you know, um, our current president, president pulling out of Paris really mobilized you, you know, lots of things. And I think a lot of people on this call pushed hard on, on the, new, uh, the new mayor, Mayor Nuremberg, and, and the new council. And, and back in 2017, you know, I think um, the community was successful in getting council to pass a resolution in support of the Paris Climate Agreement. I mean, that, that was a game changer, uh, basically committing uh, the city to um, uh, doing our part to reduce our contributions to global climate change, uh, limiting it to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, and more importantly, um, adapting to uh, those impacts that we see now, um, particularly for our most vulnerable communities. Um, that also um, led to the development of the SA Climate Ready Plan. Uh, you know, one year ago, um, uh, that was adopted by council. And I'd like to thank many of you uh, who are on this call for your part. Uh, you know, hundreds of, of thousands of hours were put into this. So I want to thank you all for, for your commitment, as well as the, you know, more than 10,000 community um, residents and stakeholders who participated in the process. And, you know, the plan was adopted. It's not perfect. You know, I, I mean, I think we all we all know that um, there's those who question, why do we even do it? Um, <laughs> and then there's those who say, you know, it, it wasn't aggressive enough. But I, I think that the, the, the thing was it increased the community dialogue around this. The first step is to talk about this. And, you know, the, the, the amount of media attention, the amount of um, discussion, it was fantastic. I, I think the challenge we've we've hit as, as discussed is COVID hit. You know, there's been a lot of work still going on in, on internal municipal sustainability, but other priorities have prevailed. Um, and, and I think now, I, I think as, as Greg has alluded, we'll, we're going to start seeing a lot more action coming now. But, you know, it, it's, it's not just, you know, COVID and, and the recession. Um, it's also climate change is a moving target. You know, it's not like climate change is 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 static. Uh, things are accelerating. Things aren't getting any better. So questions come up in my mind is, you know, is carbon neutrality by 2050 even the right target anymore? I mean, we're seeing different, you know, other cities, you know, doing the next iteration of climate plans and they're more aggressive. So I think we constantly have to look at, uh, you know, where, where we are. Uh, we'll have our, our 2019 inventory done hopefully by the end of the year. And it's probably going to be pretty enlightening. You know, I, 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 what I'm seeing is, we're making progress, but it's probably not going to be fast enough. So what are we going to do? How are we going to respond to that? Um, the other thing is, and you're sort of building on that, is just look at the news. Look at what's going on uh, in, in California, in the Northwest, in Colorado. I mean, wildfires are just unbelievable. And, they, and it's not just impacting the communities. It's impacting national air quality. Uh, we have one of the most active hurricane seasons uh, on record. Um, we ran out of letters. Um, that affects, you know, not just our neighbors on the Gulf Coast, but but us as well, as far as a, a support service for these communities. And just look at the extreme heat we experienced this summer. So, I mean, there's major issues happening now that we really need to mobilize as quickly as possible. So, one of, but, but the other thing is it's not just about climate um, mitigation, reducing emissions. What we're seeing is cities are trying to rethink how they approach climate. It's not about those emissions, it's about people. It's about acknowledging that uh, not everyone contributes the same to climate change or is impacted the same. And that's basically built into the climate plan, as Greg has mentioned, defining climate equity. So what we're seeing is leading, leading cities are beginning to look at how they reframe climate action by leading with people first. 
um, particularly with that focus on, focus on racial equity. Um, my office, Office of Sustainability, first started talking about equity way back at the, when we, we were developing the SA Tomorrow Sustainability Plan, simply by using equity as a, a cross-cutting theme, just trying to sort of normalize it. You know, what is equity? You know, why should we be um, focusing, on, focusing on it? But it was very much just scratching the surface. Uh, a year later in 2017, uh, the city of San, San Antonio officially um, established the Office of Equity, which has been a huge asset, um, empowering uh, different, different departments, putting expectations on different departments to make sure that they're looking at their work through a lens of equity. It's not enough just to keep doing business as usual, but really thinking about what can we do better? What, what have we been doing that's been negatively impacting um, uh, different members of our community and how do we adjust it? And they've been a huge ally for us. So, you know, in the cap, um, we tried to work on centering equity. And I, I think, Greg, you're, you're right. I mean, I think at the time, our plan really was unique. But what I would say is, it's not going to be unique for much longer. It's, it's cities across the country are um, making sure equity is at the forefront. And I think everyone's in a, in a learning space. But I, I think the key is going to be, at the end of the day, about access for community members in the conversation, in the decision making. How do we make it real? You know, it, it's not enough for the city just to talk to people, it's what, what, is, what, what is action going to look like? And so I, I just want to spend a little bit on what, we're, what my view is as far as how we move forward on this. You know, but the Climate Equity Committee, uh, we developed the Climate Equity Technical Working Group um, as a part of the climate plan. And I'll be the first to say it was far from perfect. I, I think my expectations of what we were going to do far exceeded reality. Um, dealing with equity, dealing with systemic racism, is a big issue, um, and it's it, 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 it you know, but I think it it, it it was a learning experience for me and my office, and I think it's hopefully going to help inform how we go forward into this next phase. Um, but the group developed that climate equity equity definition, developed a draft equity screening mechanism that it, you know the goal is to help us um, before we make any big decisions on a policy or a program, we take a step back and we talk with the community and then understand not only how is this not make sure that this isn't going to um, create inequities, but is there a way to help um, um, reduce and alleviate historic inequities? Looking back, how can we make things better? Um, you know, but the big question is, got the plan adopted, um, we're, we're moving forward, how do we ensure that we actually use equity in, in moving forward? So the big thing that's coming up is council just approved uh, two um, uh, uh, advisory committees, the technical commu community and the climate equity advisory committee. Uh, we're planning on having a launch uh, kickoff orientation meeting with them uh, probably the third week in next month. But the thing we're really excited is these groups are going to get racial equity training, um, uh, pretty extensive racial equity training with a consultant that we're, we're bringing on board, also working with the Office of Equity. But this will be the first official board and commission to go through a process where, all right, everybody, what is, what is racism? What does it mean to our community? And, and what does it mean for our work around climate? Um, we're hoping that it sets a really good standard for just the city as a, as a whole in terms of how we engage with um, boards and commissions. Um, through the work of these committees, um, we're going to refine and employ that climate equity screening mechanism um, for specific policies and programs. So for example, you know, we're working on um, EV and solar readiness requirements for new construction, energy and water benchmarking for large commercial buildings, and deploying citywide electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and asking questions, um, you know, how do we ensure that these programs not only result in reduced emissions and increased resilience, but address issues of inequity and systemic racism? So, you know, we have to ask those questions as we move forward on policy development. The other thing we're going to be working with them on is, is uh, initiating a citywide communications and engagement campaign with the objective of partnering with um, and providing resources to grassroots organizations to make sure that, you know, it's not just the city going out and engaging. That's not necessarily our best thing, but making sure that we're empowering our partners to have those conversations with particularly our most vulnerable populations and disenfranchised communities. So we have you know, a, a legitimate dialogue and understand what the issues are that can help inform our process going forward. Um, the other thing, and the last thing I'd mention is, you know, really, it's really about 
continuing to acquire and analyze data to help inform our decisions. I'm really excited. We received some energy burden household data as a part of the American Cities Climate Challenge. So we can really start seeing who's paying what, you know, and, and what, 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 are, what, how does race factor into this? Uh, we're also going to be working with UTSA this year on a heat vulnerability assessment tool, which is going to give us some uh, more detailed urban heat island uh, temperature data. So again, how do we start using this data with equity indicators to start prioritizing where we make investments? You know, it's not just enough to say we've got these policies and these goals, but how are we using the data to actually make sure that we're addressing um, inequities? Uh, so I'm almost done, I promise. Um, and this brings us today. Uh, you know, as we confront COVID-19, economic, the economic recession and systemic racism, we need to be aware of the synergies with the climate plan. Uh, we need to ensure that as we implement policies and programs to respond to these current priorities, we do, do so through a lens of climate action and climate justice to ensure that we're not only um, leveraging these resources, but we don't run counter to our climate and equity goals and commitments. So I'll end with this last question. How do we ensure that our current actions and responses are not just a recovery, but a green recovery? Um, and, and where, you know, a green recovery where we bounce forward as a more resilient and equitable community. So I look forward to the conversation and hearing your all thoughts as far as how do we actually do that. So thank you. That's awesome, Doug. Thank you very much. Um, and we did do a little juggle, but I know we've, we want to bring in Dr. Montoya and, and, we, and we talk about cl climate, we talk about food and all the different areas that people's lives are impacted, right, by, by policy making and, and, and frankly, racist policy making that led San Antonio where we are right now, uh, kind of like fumbling with, with COVID and looking back over these long patterns and practices. Uh, and I know, Dr. Montoya, you've been doing a lot of research into SAWS and, and, and rates and more, but I want to make sure to get uh, get you in, get your time in, because I know you've got a three o'clock, and then we're going to open up. I see a, a question in here uh, for, for you, Doug. We're going to sit on questions, add them to the chat, folks. Uh, and I know we'll still have Doug, and I believe Maria will be with us, uh, so we'll be able to have a little dialogue before the second section. So uh, thank you very much, Doug. Uh, we'll be talking in a minute, and uh, Dr. Montoya, please uh, come on in. Great. Thank you uh, very much, Greg, and thank, thank you to Diana also for organizing this, uh, this very cool uh, meeting that we're having. And thanks again also to Maria and, and to Doug uh, for the amazing work that you guys are, are doing. Uh, my name is, is Alfred Montoya. I'm a, a medical anthropologist at Trinity University, um, and I've been asked to talk a little bit about some research that, uh, that Dr. McGuire, who I, I believe will speak right after me, my colleague and accomplice uh, in, in this work um, that we've done on utilities uh, and what that might mean in terms of equity uh, and how we are going to confront uh, the challenges of, of climate change here in this particular city. So I'm gonna just try to keep within the five minutes and go as quickly as, as I possibly can. Uh, and I'm gonna start with some very, very obvious uh, facts. SAWS uh, is a monopoly uh, here in this market and it controls a resource that is essential to life and health. It is also a public entity because of these factors, SAWS, I believe, has an added responsibility to do right by San Antonians, to play a crucial role in the social and economic recovery of our community from this pandemic, to serve as a reliable partner in and a platform for our community's response to the effects of climate. Between 2015 and today, the average residential customer bill from SAWS uh, has increased by 50%, uh, and most of this increase is in terms of the fixed rates uh, that each payer pays. By increasing the fixed rates, this means that this is the amount that regardless of how much money you use, uh, you will still have to pay this increase. This places an unavoidable burden on households, particularly those who are most economically stressed. And additionally, by increasing just the fixed rates, these kinds of rate increases do nothing to incentivize water conservation. So it doesn't matter how much you cut back on your water use. They also don't disincentivize water wasting. And we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, during the end of my time, uh, what that might mean. Rate hikes uh, of this kind uh, increase the financial burden, quite obviously, on the least advantaged ratepayers. So this is a group who already is paying a higher proportion of their income, their sort of monthly income for basic necessities like food, like housing, health care, and utilities. These kinds of rate increases also affect those persons in our community who have been paying the longest. So long-term residents are additionally burdened because they have been around and they have been contributing for more time than newcomers. Dr. McGuire and I have looked uh, and, and done preliminary analysis at some SAWS 
data from the last few years since this rate restructuring occurred in 2015. And we've come to basically two general conclusions. One, that those who are most affected by interruptions and service cutoffs are concentrated uh, in our most disadvantaged inner city zip codes. And mostly these are communities of color. The second uh, so conclusion from our analysis, our preliminary analysis, is that these kinds of rate increases increase the difficulty uh, of covering costs for people who um, already have a difficulty paying bills you know, every month. And so this is increasing and compounding economic stress for those people who can least afford it. And in many cases, driving residents in these particular areas to seek predatory loans, payday loans, and so on, these other kinds of um, fairly nasty high interest rate or high fixed rate um, types of loans in order to cover the costs of these uh, surprising utility bills or increasing utility bills. These concentrations of intergenerational poverty in particular sections of our city are the result of a legacy of segregation and redlining that we have not contended with uh, properly over the last century, more or less, and decades of marginalization and disenfranchisement. So there are structural reasons why this kind of poverty uh, is concentrated in certain areas for certain communities, uh, predominantly people of color in the city. There have also been cases, and journalists have reported on this for the past year, which SAWS data, so the very data that Dr. McGuire and I have spent time analyzing, this very data on discipline, um, uh, cutoffs and, and service interruptions has been used by real estate developers. So real estate developers are taking this data to identify those households or parts of the city uh, in which people are experiencing economic precarity. Uh, and so when they use this data to so, say, oh, this, these people have had their water shut off, um, this indicates to the developer that these might also be households that be willing to sell their properties for much cheaper, right? People who are experiencing sort of economic uh, trouble. It is perfectly obvious uh, to anybody who's looked at this data or spent any time in San Antonio that this kind of rate increase for this public utility uh, is a form of um, uh, theft, basically. And it constitutes an additional form of structural violence that places already stressed households on the brink of social and economic catastrophe. This precarity uh, is something that other more unscrupulous parties are now uh, taking advantage of, right? So placing these people certain of our community members in this kind of precarity gives a chance uh, for others to capitalize upon them. And these other actors uh, are obviously not persons or actors who have the best interests of our community at heart. Rate increases themselves uh, that SAWS has, has um, sort of engaged in for the past five years are for infrastructure that actually won't help or benefit these particular communities at all. This, uh, the increases were to pay for um, infrastructure that'll benefit water intensive industry that we would like to keep or to draw to San Antonio. And these increases also benefit developers and new homeowners in the growing sprawl uh, that is obviously unsustainable environmentally uh, in this city. Essentially what these increases represent is a systemic theft, right, from our most stressed communities and longest term residents to benefit developers, investors, unsustainable land use, and environmentally and socially irresponsible. Development. We call on SARS uh, to take seriously their special responsibility as a publicly owned monopoly of a resource that is essential for life and health. We also call on SARS to prioritize equity, the needs of the least advantaged members of our community, and to totally end this connection, right? as, as, the, as Doug and many other people have, Doug and, and Greg and many other people have suggested. Finally, we call on SARS uh, to undertake an immediate rate restructuring that creates protections for those parts of our community that have been damaged by these kind of structural forms of violence historically. We also would like a rate restructuring that incentivizes conservation and disincentivizes the kinds of waste and sprawl uh, that are obviously quite unsustainable. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I want to, uh, so I put in the chat uh, a link back to our Facebook event page. There is a, kind of a run of show in the event description for those of you who are able to uh, access that. Access that. Excuse me. Um, there are a couple questions in the chat, and I think what I want to do with the schedule, and we did have Meredith and, and, and uh, scheduled to kind of like uh, be, be bound with you here, but I think I want to take a break here. Uh, to keep Meredith and the CPS, kind of like that utility justice section that's dedicated to CPS, and open up some time here for dialogue. You've got a couple more minutes, I think. We've got Doug, we've got Maria. We've had a couple questions in the chat. 
Uh, if other people want to come in on that, then we've got a, a, a musical performance and a poem, and we'll move into section two. But I'd like to maybe open, I think the first question I saw in the chat uh, was dedicated to Doug, or targeting Doug. And it says, uh, in terms of moving forward with the CAP and these committees, would you include compensating community-based organizations for their time and expertise and in, in, in their engagement work? Yeah, and that's, and that's the plan. Um, we, we had uh, had a budget allocation um, in the last fiscal year for communications and engagement. Um, Originally, it was going, you know, we, we uh, went through a, a procurement process, um, identified a, a local contractor to help us develop and, and deliver the program. And based upon feedback from some community members and council, um, the, the intent will be to carve off um, a percentage of that uh, funding to basically be subcontracted to local grassroots organizations to assist with, um, assist with the work. It's been on hold due to COVID, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, what we're planning on doing is bringing the entire scope of work to both of the advisory committees uh, next month, both the technical and community and the equity committee, and just basically vet it there. Um, and the goal would be bringing it to council in January um, to um, basically execute it. But yes, I think we, we very much don't wanna be in a position where we're trying to lean on grassroots organizations to do the work without compensation. So I think we're, we're committed to make sure we're, we're, we're paying for the work. Thank you, Doug. Uh, there was a, a comment about how to access uh, Dr. Montoya's research. Uh, is that something published pending publication in terms of the disconnects, I suppose? So we, uh, it took us a quite a while pre-COVID to get the data, uh, the sort of giant uh, blocks of just a massive Excel spreadsheets from SAWS. So it took Dr. McGuire and I some months. Uh, and um, so we are, are sort of in the preliminary sort of stages of looking at, at that material. Uh, we've done some work in the past over the past couple of years on uh, the predatory loans and the, the way that those are related uh, to utilities uh, and increases in rates and so on. Um, so that really right now there's almost nothing that I would be comfortable <laughs> sort of sharing, but I'm very, very happy to have Zoom meetings or, or whatever to continue having these conversations and um, sort of working out what these might mean and certainly how information like this can, um, can serve to, to tell us what, what we might do in the future, right, to inform a kind of recovery plan uh, and so and, on. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, higher up in the chat, Cyrus, um, uh, an authority figure in my life, uh, he was asking about disconnections with CPS. So higher up in the chat, I actually put, we have a spreadsheet uh, that you can access all the CPS disconnections. I was talking about it um, probably at four times the speed I'm talking right now, about 20 minutes ago. Um, and uh, I was told to slow down. Thanks for the nod, Bonnie. Uh, but you can find that. So that's by year, that's by zip code, um, whatever you're looking for. But it's it's for real. I mean, it's um, really something uh, uh, that I hope people will use that information because where we are right now, like I said, that's number one on our open letter to the city. And I will say uh, that when, again, two dozen organizations put out an open letter calling for the elimination of disconnects as policy, uh, while CPS is coming to the council or on the verge of coming to the council for a vote on their conservation program and next year on rate hikes and not one city council member responded, hey, I got your, I got a bot. I got a bot from uh, Ana Sandoval's office saying, Doot, you know, something inbox registers receipt, you know, um, nobody else. Uh, so if folks are interested in organizing on these principles in these areas, SAWS, CPS, we should be expanding to SAWS, you know, based on this conversation and and hopefully we do continue it. Um, is there any other questions? There was a question about what do we do? A lot, of, a lot of this ends up at the state, right? The state may come in and, and sit on local policy, uh, but the question was, um, you know, what kind of strategic actions state policymakers can make uh, with climate change and COVID? And, and I don't know, actually, Cyrus, you're on the line. You responded about a training on December 5 that Sierra Club is doing. Does anybody want to unpack that quickly before we take uh, a quick kind of um, invite our poet in, um, who I'm very excited about, Suzanne, uh, and, uh, and, a, and an offering from Seba Ivi, who I think is still on 
the call. Did Cyrus, did you want to respond to the statement? Right, I, I can say one thing, which is, um, and this is sort of good news, uh, Aaron Zwiener, who's a local rep a little bit north of you guys in the Dripping Springs, Hayes County area, um, has released a plan, kind of a three-point plan that's part of, and it's very much a House Democratic um, plan, but uh, the three points, if I remember right, one is community protections, and they have four or five, you know, proposals under that. Another is infrastructure, sort of clean infrastructure, and they have four or five points under that. And the third one is about climate change and clean energy and things the state can do. And so we're very much working with our office on those proposals. Those are, at this point, those proposals are really just bullet points. And now we're working on the language with her office. So we do know okay. that legislation will be introduced. Um, we don't know, obviously, if it'll be successful, but part of the reason we're having a training December 5th is to try to you know, start to get a larger group of people engaged at the Texas legislature, hopefully at a Texas legislature where we have a little more leverage than we've had in the past. Uh, so okay. please do vote. Super, super. Um, good. Well, let me, let me cut. Uh, see. Oh, I think Deanna, someone messaged that Deanna had a question for Doug. Uh, Pahara is on, uh, has got a question now. I want to transition uh, if possible and really in two minutes and uh, we're, we're behind schedule by 15. <laughs> so maybe Deanna, if you had a question for Doug and then maybe Pahara, can we follow up on the closing side? Uh, no, my, my questions in the chat were the questions that Doug brought up. Um, in right, that's what I thought. What, what some of those pieces that they were, uh, what were the guiding questions that they were asking themselves. To okay. And just to have them in the chat for further uh, later discussion. That's what I thought, restating, restating those questions for discussion. Good, thank you for uh, memorializing that. Um, Pahara, let's hold that uh, for our next open uh, conversation we'll be able to we'll have more leisure towards the end uh, and the question about uh, non-paying customers so if you'll hold that and maybe Vanessa help us hold those questions uh, we've got a, a short video from Seba Ali who came in offering to the translation services so we're uh, grateful for that and then uh, shortly just after that there'll be a poem we're bringing in Suzanne Green uh, Vanessa if you can trans transition us and a quick note, sort of if you need to, you know, refresh on water, um, have any bio breaks, take this time to um, take this moment to, to take that break to do what you need to do. Um, and that, so sort of we've set these up um, strategically um, as a break within each of our conversations so that folks are having that like break, like visual break time. Cool. Uh, or we can play the video after Suzanne. We can hot Suzanne's mic. Uh, we're having, looking for the video, I think. If you want to bring Suzanne. You want me to go ahead now? Yeah, let's, okay, well, the rest of us mute. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. I, it's uh, just amazing to hear all the work that everybody's doing and, and, and also to just, I think, sense the frustration that you know, it's very, very hard to make the changes that we need to make um, to be able to come together and for people to realize the seriousness of our situation. Um, and so I'm going to read you just a couple of poems, but this one I call Waiting Room. It was inspired by um, a visit back home to see my family and kind of a a reminder of when I was a kid waiting for mum to pick me up at the train station and what happened. So it's called Waiting Room. No one likes waiting, seats stiff and uncomfortable, the occupants nervous. And I can't be sure the day my mind woke up to the taxi cab waiting room near London, a chilly night in January. And there was the metal coffee table and tatty magazines. And gliding through the pages, with only half measure of interest, I found written in a space measuring only about two inches wide by six inches deep, a text which described the sixth mass extinction happening now. Thank 
you. And then uh, just one more. <laughs> this was uh, coming back this summer from a little trip, a little road trip, just to get out into some fresh air. And uh, it speaks about the importance of being brave and uh, saying what you need to say and, and taking action. It's called firing synapses, joining dots. Down the mountain, we came to a sunny meadow drawn by the sight of sunflowers several feet tall who were waving to us. And closer we saw a small vegetable garden being tended by the residents, a mother, her grown up daughter, and an older fellow providing them instruction in the setting of a vole trap. The voles being accused of sabotaging their sweet pea patch. And who knows how these conversations begin in one place and detour to another. But before too long, the mother shares her concerns about our spiraling world, each of us facing like a mirror. And as I turn to leave, she encourages saying, we must speak up because for every person who hears, maybe they'll share with someone else. And all the while, Timmy, is my dog, has been digging a hole in the soft brown earth it's not that our words weren't of interest, but catching scent of a burrower, there was work to be done. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity. Excellent, thank you. Um, I am waiting, I don't see the video. Vanessa, are you able to access it? Yes, give me one second. Okay, great. So we're going to, this is a, a friend of ours, Seva Eli, uh, um, uh, kind of a, a special uh, member of our community. Uh, and um, I, I wish you were here to introduce uh, for herself, but we'll hopefully by the end of the call have, at least for those who are interested in learning more about her as a musician, as an artist, and as an organizer um, uh, for, not sold for, but by organizing people of Lenca descent in the United States, um, just let us know and, and we'll make those connections uh, for you. Uh, after this short video, we have uh, Stukster, the Chief Operating Officer at CPS Energy here. Uh, I wanted to bring him in particularly uh, after this last meeting, they have a, a basically are putting out, uh, they had a request for information from this being followed by a request for proposals on um, a big bite of solar, 900 megawatts of solar, 500 megawatts of what they're calling firming capacity. Uh, which originally was going to be natural gas, could still be, or could be something else. And I think that what came back in that meeting was a lot of really interested energy storage solutions. So we're taking a sideways step from the coal conversation, because I think it's important to also be aware of, uh, of these other developments where we see something happening. It's like, oh, that looks like what we want to realize in San Antonio, uh, because we do focus a lot and rightfully so on the San Antonio we don't want to inhabit and that we don't want to continue to, to allow to, to function, right? Uh, on a planet in peril. So um, we'll roll this uh, video and we'll get on with Chris. Thank you. Greg, I think we're having some trouble with, with audio. I'm not able to hear it. Yeah, and uh, we may let may have to let that roll uh, as it is. So let's take another poetry break with this video. Um, enjoy the, and we'll come back in conversation.
and we can try again later in the program. We have some time commitments to speakers, so um, we won't pause here to do any technical work. But um, Chris, if you are here and, and ready to line up, I kind of gave you a, a, a setup before the video, um, uh, but I would love it if you could kind of come in and, and just let folks know what is happening in terms of clean energies and opportunities within uh, the bundle flex, which you could define as well. And then we can, uh, Meredith McGuire will be coming in. We can have further conversations about utility rates uh, and issues around the coal plant. Thank you. I know Chris, uh, Dr. Chris might have called in, um, so I'm not sure if you're still here. Hey, Greg. Can yeah, you hear I hear you. I hear you. I, I was I called in with my by my phone, and I don't think the two were associated. But is this okay? I mean, can you hear? Yeah, me? I see you now, and, and hear you. Thank you. Welcome. Well, thank you, thank you, Greg, and thank you for having us uh, here as as. Uh, Part of the program uh, about the climate action adaptation plan and anniversary and giving us an opportunity to talk a little bit about the flex power bundle um, so with that I'll, I'll just go through the slides here um, can you everyone see them uh, yeah yes okay uh, if we go to page two scroll yeah perfect um, so the first thing I want to just give some background and context before we get into the flex power bundle. Uh, you know, over the past 10 years, we have built out a strong, diverse, renewable portfolio across Texas. Uh, we almost, we had very little uh, before that. Um, and now we've got wind, we've got West Texas wind, we've got coastal wind, we have solar all across the state and a lot of solar right here in uh, San Antonio as part of the fabric of our community. Uh, we have over 1,600 megawatts of renewables. So I think we've been an early leader in renewables and we want to continue that momentum with the Flex Power Bundle. Uh, the 400 megawatts was a landmark deal and, and we want to, you know, more than double that with, with the 900 megawatt uh, uh, power bundle. So if you go to the next page, page three, please. Uh, before I get into the Flex Power Bundle, I just want to you know, show a couple, and I don't know if Alan Montemayor is on, but he always encourages us to think about water and energy together. Uh, and so this is a picture of the, the sink and solar plant that we did with SAWS at their Dos Rios Wastewater Treatment Plant. It took a little bit more time. We could have done this in, you know, in, in the empty field of West Texas, but we, we really wanted to put it there at Dos Rios where there is a lot of sort of uh, land that is, is hard to develop in a perfect place for solar. And, uh, and I, I thought this was a nice uh, a, a picture of, of that site uh, and a tribute to, to Bill Sinkin and, and you know, his founding of, of Solar San Antonio. Uh, CPS Energy has over 500 megawatts of solar to date. And so we've, again, uh, we're a leader there. If you go to the next page. We also have quite a bit of wind in our portfolio, uh, over a thousand megawatts of wind. And, and one of the questions that has come up with the renewables is how resilient are they? You know, can, they can our coastal wind farms survive a hurricane? And the, the great news is it, it did. In August 2017, when Hurricane Harvey hit Corpus Christi, uh, we, had, we have a wind farm uh, in that area and it survived. And it, so it does show the resiliency of, um, of, of some of these resources. Even hail, when hail comes through the solar farm, it will damage some of the panels. But for the most part, renewables have, have shown that they are resilient uh, uh, for us. So again, that is some good news uh, there. If you go to the next page, um, we've learned a lot through our, you know, owning renewables here over the last uh, decade. And a couple of things I want to highlight again at, as a setup for the Flex Power Bundle. Wind, while it generates a lot of zero emission uh, electrons, uh, it is challenging. It's harder to uh, have consistent wind production uh, when we need it. And there's a lot of, pro this is an ERCOT chart, which shows the wind and how it drops off in the afternoon. 
So even though the state may have 25,000 megawatts of wind, you know, we have seen afternoons, maybe one or 2,000 shows up. And it's not just, you know, 30 minutes, it, it, it stretches several hours and it really does stress the system. And this profile where the wind drops off over the afternoon, especially on a, you know, a, a stagnant 105 degree August afternoon um, and then picks up in the evening is, is you know, we see that profile uh, often. So that's one of the, the challenges with wind. If you go to the next page. So the beauty of solar is it's a lot more consistent on those afternoons. If it is 105 degrees, not a cloud in the sky on an August afternoon, we know those solar panels are producing. And so this is, this is actual production of our solar systems uh, over two days. And you can see that uh, we have over, you know, over 500 megawatts of generation uh, uh, you know, during those afternoon periods. And it, the beauty of it is it, it's very complementary to the wind. So it fits that, that dip that we see in wind on those afternoon uh, days. And then the wind will pick up in the evenings to, to, to uh, when the solar goes away. So the, the two resources are quite complementary. And, uh, and so that's why we are pretty excited about adding more solar to our system. If you go to the next page. You know, Greg, when I was looking for, uh, you know, charts to put the presentation together, I came across this one. I thought it was, it was, it was uh, pretty cool. So this was our solar in 2017. Um, and again, this is actual production data, you know, up to 400 megawatts. And, you, you know, some people have home systems of 10, 15 kW. This is 400 megawatts. Uh, so it's pretty cool the size. But that day we had a, a solar eclipse and you can see it taking a bite out of that solar production, which was kind of interesting. Uh, of course, that's easy to fill in with demand response, energy efficiency, or even energy storage. So if you go to the next page. So for us, energy storage is really key to the renewables because the wind and the solar are not perfect fits. I mean, they, there's a lot of good complementary over, overlap, but there will still be gaps where those resources will not show up and we do need uh, you know, power for our, our homes and businesses. So energy storage is key to filling in the gaps for, for renewables. We already have some experience with energy storage. We have uh, two projects. Uh, the most recent is the 10 megawatt one hour battery system at the Southwest Research Institute. Um, and so we are learning as, as we go uh, with these projects, just like we've learned a lot with solar and wind. We go to the next page. The other thing that's important in terms of filling all these pieces, it's almost like a puzzle we're trying to put together. You've got solar, you've got wind, you've got energy storage. Uh, energy efficiency and demand response is an, also a very important part of this, this puzzle. So uh, through our STEP program, we have over 250 megawatts of demand response, uh, partnering with you know, over 400,000 customers. Um, and this is, this is energy that we can call on you know, at any moment at any time. So we can basically fill in some of those gaps with this, uh, what we call a virtual power plant. Uh, so again, that's an important piece as well. If you go to the next page. So that takes us to the Flex Power Bundle. And really this is, in my view, just it really takes us to that next step up uh, from where we've been over the past 10 years. We're talking about 900 megawatts of solar. Solar is the centerpiece of this generation mix. But we do need to have a bundle. We need an integrated approach because of all the challenges that, that, you know, that I talked about. A battery storage will be a, a component of that. But we also need to firm up that solar. And um, you know, batteries may be part of that. But we are taking an all source uh, approach, looking at all sorts of different technologies to see how we can firm up the solar. You know, the solar will, especially in, in the late afternoons at six, six, seven o'clock, you know, the sun is going down, but customers are still using air conditioners at seven, eight, nine o'clock at night. And so energy storage is a great way to extend that profile of solar so that we can support our customers. And we do want to take not just a quantitative approach to the Flex Power Bundle, but we want to look at you know, social equity aspects, uh, the environment, of course, uh, and the, the economics of, of some of these proposals. So it really is a sustainable approach that we want to take for, um, you know, for this RFP that ultimately we get to. Uh, if you go to the next page. So we, we launched an RFI to basically raise the awareness of what we're doing. This is going to be a huge deal. So we want to make sure that everyone was aware of it. 
Um, and we also wanted to kind of get insight into what kind of technologies are out there, what's the indicative pricing, what's the availability of some of these. And we got proposals from uh, over 200 uh, different uh, responses uh, across five different continents, uh, North America, South America, Europe, uh, Asia, and Australia. Most of the proposals came from, from uh, North America, but again, we got good representation from across the globe uh, for what we're trying to do here in San Antonio. You go to the next page. So some of the insights we got on solar, uh, we saw very competitive and attractive terms. What, what I found interesting is we saw proposals across uh, the state. This was not just West Texas solar. We saw things at, on, in, in the South Texas region, North Texas, even East Texas, and, and 16 proposals right here in San Antonio. Uh, contract terms, 10 to 25 years, project sizes, five megawatts to 900 megawatts, and indicative pricing, you know, where we expected, we expected prices to be in the 20, in the $20 uh, range per megawatt hour. We saw prices from 18 to $60 a megawatt hour. So again, pretty consistent, but very competitive and attractive terms that we got there. If you go to the next page. We also got some very good, solid uh, uh, battery storage uh, uh, responses as well. We received 35 proposals there. A majority were, were located at the transmission level, but we did see some that were at the distribution level. Um, durations were, this was one of the key things that we wanted to better understand. What is the duration of, of some of these battery storage systems? And we saw kind of one to four hours, which is what, we what we've what we seen kind of across the industry. Uh, project sizes, 10 megawatts to 400 megawatts and, and uh, indicative pricing about $3 a kW month to $15 a kW month. If you go to the next page. So we also wanted to look at long duration uh, storage. Uh, you know, Greg, as you said, you know, we want to you know, we want to look at an all source approach to how do we cover a load for six hours, nine hours, twelve hours. Um, you know, several years back we had a polar vortex where you know there was no solar. We had a winter peak, which means you know there was a lot of heating that was going on, uh, electrical heating. Um, and, and we, uh, we didn't have any solar because there was a lot of cloud cover. Some of the wind farms were, were iced in. And so really, how do we get through a, peer, a longer duration? And so this was a, a pretty interesting area that we really wanted to get more insight on. And we saw some very interesting ideas. Uh, compressed air uh, storage systems where you take when there's plenty uh, renewable energy, you take that energy and you compress air into an uh, underground cavern, a, a salt dome typically. Um, and then you can reverse that process when, you know, your customers need that energy and, uh, and, 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 and energy scarce. So uh, that's, that's a one. And there's a couple projects that have already, that have already built, been built on that. And so, so that's, that's you know, an area that we are looking at. Uh, another proposal was around liquid air storage, where you basically liquefy air into, you know, liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen. And uh, you do that, you know, when, again, when there's a lot of renewables and, and power is, is plentiful and cheap, uh, you, 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 you use that energy to liquefy the air, and then you reverse that process when you want to, um, you know, get energy back out. The interesting thing about this is the duration of the storage is defined by, is, is set by the, the volume of the tanks. So if you need a longer duration storage, you make the, the tanks bigger and, and you can, uh, you can reverse that process and you can get energy over a longer period of time. We've seen some thermal energy storage uh, where you basically take uh, energy and you, you thermally store it uh, and then you reverse that process again when you, when you need it. You know, we've seen this in, in, in solar thermal solutions, molten salt, things like that. Uh, hydro, uh, again, we've, you see a lot of hydro in, in the Northwest. Um, pumped hydro, what we've seen here is underground hydro where you're pressurizing uh, with water underground, uh, maybe an old abandoned oil field uh, and you pressurize that with water using energy that's plentiful and, and readily available and then you reverse that process when you need it. And then finally, we saw some kinetic energy uh, storage uh, 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 proposals and this is, these are flywheels where you again use energy and you, you uh, rotate things to very high RPMs, 30,000 RPMs, and then you can reverse that process as well. Um, we, we didn't see as many fuel cell uh, proposals around hydrogen where you take uh, uh, hydrogen and, and when you combine it with the, a water molecule 
you uh, uh, you you release energy, and when you when you uh, I'm sorry, yeah, you release energy, and when you split it, it, it takes energy to to split, and out of the out of the tailpipe, so to speak, you get uh, basically water uh, coming out. So it's it, through electrolysis. That's a very clean fuel source. And we're interested in that, and, and maybe that's something that may show up more on the, when, when the RFP uh, goes out. So if you go to the last page, our path forward is to uh, really finalize the RFP documents and evaluation process from what we've learned here with the RFI and continue community and stakeholder outreach like this um, and, and launch the Flex Power Bundle RFP. And that, uh, that concludes my, my presentation. Well, cool. thank you, Chris. I see a, uh, I guess, the move the camera. Um, thanks, Vanessa. Um, and we've got uh, Meredith McGuire up. Now, there's a couple of questions already on the stack, and I'm going to hold on to these because, uh, because we are running behind and we do have uh, speakers who we need to keep up with. Uh, those questions maybe we cannot reach on this call. Um, Chris, we, can we forward, we can continue with you there and, and, and deliver back to registrants um, th those questions they put into the chat? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you. Yeah, just what, please direct them to us and, and we'll certainly get back to folks with them. And, yeah. and Greg, th thank you again for, for having us on here. Absolutely. All right. Thanks. And um, let's see, Meredith, can we bring you in you've been patiently waiting um and uh let's see borat we'll follow up on that powerpoint question um let's see where's meredith meredith has a, a short um discussion i know we're, we've been talking a lot about rates we we're talking about rates earlier with um dr montoya um let's see vanessa you're able to bring meredith up on the screen Is there a problem? There, we see you now. Okay, good. I don't have a problem. Don't come at me like that. <laughs> you, okay. it's all, the floor The floor is yours, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, my name is Meredith McGuire. I'm a recently retired uh, professor at Trinity University where I work with uh, Dr. Montoya and uh, I'm also the conservation co-chair for uh, the local uh, Sierra Club. Uh, I'm going to focus on both the uh, SAWS and uh, CPS Energy, although I'll probably spend most of the time on CPS Energy, but in many respects, a lot of the problems are the same. Um, so I want to start out by emphasizing that public utilities are important for the well-being of the whole community but they need to promote the public good. And in many respects, what's happening in San Antonio is abandoning the public good and operating the public utilities for the benefits of certain industries or businesses in the community, very little about the larger good. Water is necessary for health, hygiene, and for life itself. And all the residents deserve to have enough water for maintaining that life and health regardless of their ability to pay. Electricity too is necessary for health and well-being and maintaining life, uh, especially uh, now what with climate change increasing the likelihood of extreme heat events, we really need to have enough electricity to keep houses cool enough to prevent uh, deaths. And there have already been some deaths in San Antonio due to um, uh, high uh, temperatures and people being afraid to turn on the air conditioning because they couldn't afford the bills. So uh, we, we really have to give more attention to this uh, problem about the utilities bills and their rate structures because as the COVID virus has shown us, we're, we're already on the edge of people being so un, unable to afford their uh, utility rates that they are, are losing their uh, homes, they are struggling to pay uh, basic bills and so forth, and having to choose between uh, paying their utility bills and perhaps not having enough food 
or medicine for the family's well-being. Even before the pan pandemic triggered the pay cuts and layoffs, rates charged by SAWS and CPS Energy were already unaffordable for upward of 40% of San Antonio's households. Uh, tens of thousands of households have had their water shut off due to unpaid bills each year. Many who, were pay who paid the bills were trapped by payday lenders that they went to because they were afraid of having their water shut off or their uh, energy shut off. So we've got a mountain of burdens already. And then just in the last year, that, that has been multiplied by many, many times. So even though it's good that there has been a moratorium on the uh, utility bills, uh, when that, when those houses have or those households have to pay those bills, they're stuck with the fact that they haven't got any new money coming in. How are they going to even keep up with what they need for their own families? So. It, I see it as an emergency, and I hope that City Council will take up the issue soon so that they can prevent some of the worst uh, impacts of some of these uh, mounting bills. Uh, I think that we ought, ought to ask the question about how San Antonio can have a just recovery for our local economy. That's a really important thing because a just economy for the whole nation would be wonderful. But we have to have extra help here in San Antonio because so many people are already struggling even before this pandemic. So uh, SAWS and CPS energy have to be part of that solution, not just the cause of further economic problems, but be part of this, the solution. I think one big step would be to reform the rates and making them truly fair. The current rate structures are very unfair to residential customers. The fixed charges are extremely unfair because they are regressive. They take up huge proportions of low-income families' meager pay, uh, leaving them to struggling to decide whether to pay that bill or some other pressing need like food. Eliminating the fixed charges for households in the parts of town that Dr. Montoya described where redlining and other unjust restrictions have prevented families from being able to build assets. That would go a long way toward making their rates fair. Um, there is an organization, and I'm gonna have trouble remembering exactly what it is, but it has to do with rate affordability, um, and especially for the energy uh, sector. And, and the, um, I think it's RAP is the uh, initials, but I don't remember the details. They say that there's, no reason in the world that there should be fixed charges for those kinds of basic um, uh, costs because the reality is that a lot of businesses don't charge by the uh, fixed charges they charge by unit prices according to how much people use or how much people buy of, of some product so I think that uh, that would go a long way toward making CPS and uh, SAWS rates much more fair. I recognize that CPS fixed um, costs aren't as anywhere near as steep as SAWS. SAWS fixed charges are the highest in the state uh, and uh, they come to about basically, they come to about $30, $30 a month. And then when you add that to uh, CPS's fixed charges and the storm, fixed stormwater charges, you could have uh, families needing to have to pay a huge chunk of their monthly bills just to cover the fixed charges. So uh, I think that we need to find better ways of, of building the rate structures such as the one that the RAP project has. Um, I may be, that P may stand for project, I can't, I can't remember. Uh, but anyhow, if we have a better way to charge, not so much about the uh, total amount of money that CPS needs to cover its costs, but to focus um, ways by which we can 
get more money recirculating in the in the community rather than going straight out of of corporate to head corporate headquarters and reinvesting there for the corporation's benefit and the stockholders' pockets, not helping the city of San Antonio grow our economy locally and help us recover. Um, I think that the current rate structures are especially unfair because they are rigged to reduce significantly the cost of energy to the profitable businesses that use the most water and or energy. And in effect, then, San Antonio's families are forced to subsidize corporations that are attracted to locate here to take advantage of San Antonio's cheap water, cheap energy, and cheap labor. A far better rate structure would have prices parallel the rates of the residential customers, the business rates parallel those, but instead of giving low prices to all heavy users, would use the prices to create incentives for businesses to invest in greater energy efficiency measures and demand reduction, and also to create incentives for businesses to co-invest in distributed energy resources close to those where those businesses are located. I think it's entirely possible that with the uh, cooperation of those businesses, then San Antonio could reach our renewable goals much more rapidly. Climate change is already making life in South Central Texas more damaging and dangerous. Severe droughts, flash floods, violent storms, and most deadly of all, greater frequency of extreme heat. San Antonio needs to invest in measures to protect citizens and increase resilience. That means, for example, increasing the efforts to weatherize older homes and to install energy efficient appliances and, and HVAC systems. Done right, those projects can produce more jobs, more community solar power, more green infrastructure to deal with stormwater and rain. And by prior, prioritizing the needs of historically disadvantaged communities, um, that would make a big difference economically, but also creating incentives for all parts of the city to become resilient. I'll stop there. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Meredith. Um, uh, and that kind of sends us back to earlier, if folks missed the, uh, the five demands of our open letter to the mayor and council at the top of the call, uh, I can put them back in. We're running about maybe 10 to 15 behind right now. I wanna share uh, something real quick. Um, let me open uh, this uh let's see no it's not what i want to do um but i do want to um let's see i shared earlier uh a couple documents and i'm wondering if i can get my screen up here now um, hold on just a second no it's not going to let me do it but uh, i guess a qu this is i guess we should move the video um Vanessa, can you cut off Meredith and over to me for two seconds before we move in discussion? Sure, I'm gonna try to do this one more time. Um, okay, we're not ready for the music yet. If that's where you're headed. No, I'm just like getting prepared, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can you put my video up? You are up. I am. Okay. All right. Good. Um, I think. Uh, anyway, well, I just I think one of the reasons I should just say like what we haven't gotten to on this call yet. We have the the open letter that has the the demand uh, to sh shutting down the coal plant. Uh, there's obviously uh, there's an a, a rising movement right of people who are not waiting to have this kind of sitting at the table with you know, uh, uh, the, the curious council members we've been waiting for to listen to this dialogue uh, about utility justice in San Antonio and who bears the cost for poor decisions and who's bearing the cost of fixed fees or who's bearing the cost for Vista Ridge and pipelines across the state uh, or coal plants who are operating when they should be closed, uh, when the world is in crisis and the world is on fire. Um, so I, I, I send folks back to the, the climate action plan. Why is spruce important? 
Um, and, and why are there people with clipboards at all the polling sites collecting signatures to change the governance structure of CPS Energy so it is no longer run by the Board of Trustees with this distant, you know, a uh, 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 charter distance between the, the city itself, why, where we can uh, uh, have that same work done within the council, within a committee, that people can begin to uh, make the changes that need to happen, which is including shutting down the coal plant is on that petition. Uh, but why, why is Spruce important? And, and, and in fact, I got asked a lot, kind of like uh, journalists or, you know, uh, in this case, case, it was a student news newspaper. What are you trying to do in San Antonio uh, to avert, you know, climate crisis? Well, uh, participating in the climate action plan, I will tell you, uh, in, 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 in our math and the calculations and in, 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 in assumptions that were given to the members to work with, uh, we the, we were you know told roughly the city of San Antonio is producing 17 and a half million metric tons of greenhouse uh, carbon equivalent greenhouse gases every year. Um, I did a 10 year analysis of where the average emissions from the coal plant, and it's roughly 8 million metric tons of that. So almost half of everything we're doing in San Antonio, all the highways, all of this, all of that, is this one two unit coal plant. Um, and there's just no other way within the, the, the climate plan has a 2030 uh, deadline, a 2040 deadline, and 2050, which is to zero, right? Um, and there's no way to reach 2030 there's without the coal plant. Uh, and so we keep coming back to that. But I will say, like, the petition, it talks about rates. It, 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 it would require a certain kind of an inclining structure so that those who are using the most will be begin to pay more rather than it functioning the inverse of that uh, and, and move the, like I mentioned, the board structure and close the coal plant uh, and frankly put the CEO, Polly Gold Williams, out of work. Uh, and I was kind of like making some notes just because I, I, we don't have a lot of time for this. It's really a better spot for dialogue. Um, but I will say that for many, many years, uh, at least the last three years, through this climate planning process with the CAP, we've been asking CPS to provide their uh, methodology, their data on uh, closing spruce. Like, what do they think will happen to our rates if they had to close the power plant and do not 9 megawatts, but 1,800 megawatts of solar and not 50 megawatts of storage, but these big compressed air you know, uh, uh, energy storage uh, systems, that's seasonal storage. I was like researching and why I wanted to have Chris on because this is, it really is, is, is incredible, it's a game changer, but those like compressed air uh, storage facilities, that's like January, February, March. I mean, you know, you hear a complaint about an eclipse maybe, uh, which was cool, I know that wasn't a complaint, but you know, this, this dip in, in wind for several days, uh, that is seasonal storage and, and that compressed or uh, the uh, liquid air storage can be weeks of storage potentially. So there's a lot going on there. Um, but with the disconnects and in and, and what we keep hearing back from the utility, which is another one of our demands, is that, uh, you know, that, that it's not as bad as we think it was or, you know, or, you know, you, we're in this pause period now and it's just like the way things were. Uh, and in fact, if, in, 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 if you look at the the, in the chat, you know, we have that document on there, like how many people are actually being cut off uh, and are about to start being cut off again, uh, unless this council gets really, really curious and really concerned and looks at this as a structural, a structural racism, racist policy setting again. Um, uh, but I, I thought there may be a place that there could be some common ground that maybe we could talk uh, uh, calmly about spruce with utility. And I, I have to wonder, I read this last uh, report in the media where Fitch Rating Service was beginning to say, hey, if this petition that's going forward is making us nervous, if the Board of Trustees became the city council and polit politics began to play into this, uh, we may downrate, you know, your, your bonds, you know, uh, um, City of San Antonio. And the response by the, the, the CEO, Paula Gold Williams, was, oh, well, you know, we get that climate ideology. She called this, this, this pressure, this movement for, uh, uh, for climate response, uh, for, for sanity, you know, for like something really um, grounded in science, right? I mean, this is what international science is calling for. Uh, and she just said, this is an ideology and it costs money and we don't print money, period. Uh, and so that's where it became very clear that uh, one way or another, uh, we've got to move Spruce off the table. Um, I do want to kind of move into the, the, 
and Chris is, I don't think, still with us, but into some dialogue. Uh, the bulk of that uh, we're going to be placing at the, ne the next section. We've got a reading from Marisol Cortez coming up in just a couple of minutes, and we're 15 over now. So if we can take a short five-minute uh, breathe in, maybe play Sebali's video. If you guys are good uh, and you're good with kind of idling for a minute, uh, we can open up the dialogue, a uh, more robust dialogue after we have our next speakers. Are you able to, um, is the video working for you now, Vanessa? So we are not just here begging, right? We, we are home. Don't, don't confuse it. We are not immigrants, aliens, illegals, or animals. We're human. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks to Seba Ali, and uh, we'll get uh, contact, we'll get uh, promo into the uh, comments later. I think most of the comments, most of the questions were really directed at Chris Eugster. We are going to collect those and forward those to CPS for what answers we get back, uh, and we'll be sharing with the group when we message everybody after this. Uh, I do want to introduce um, Marisol Cortez, who uh, my partner, author, scholar, uh, activist. Uh, I met her when I was working as a journalist writing about CPS in 2007, 8, uh, and, uh, and she was working, I think, then with Southwest Workers Union with Deanna uh, as a climate, maybe the first climate justice organizer over there. Um, so uh, she has a new book uh, coming out um, uh, called Luce at Midnight, uh, which is, uh, I'll let her introduce it. Um, thank you, Marisol, for, for joining us. Thank you, Greg. Um, can everybody hear me okay? There's an echo? Okay, sorry. I'm going to put some earbuds in. How's that? Can y'all hear me? Okay, good. Uh, well, thank you to Southwest Workers Union, to Sierra Club, and everyone else that's organized this event, um, and for making space for, for the arts, um, in addition to the scientific and the activist knowledge and the political knowledge that we're sharing. Um, all of these kinds of knowledges and ways of knowing are going to be critical in, um, in um, in, in participating in this movement, so thank you. Um, my name is Marisol Cortez, and I, um, I'm, a, I'm a writer, I'm an activist, and uh, a community-based scholar here in San Antonio. And um, I wanted to share with you a couple of excerpts from a novel of mine that uh, Greg mentioned the title is Luz at Midnight, Luz, L-U-Z, like light. Um, 
which is about to be published in December with Flower Song Press. And uh, it's a climate change love story. And it's set here largely in San Antonio in South Texas. I wrote it based on my involvement in different struggles for environmental and climate justice here in this city, particularly around water, around nuclear energy, around fracking, um, around land and housing rights. So, I mean, it's very much a love story, but it's also a, a deeply political story about San Antonio environmental history and kind of some of the internal dynamics that I saw and continue to see arise repeatedly across various struggles, you know, the way private influence forecloses public access to the decision making process about the places where we live. Um, the way climate and other problems get imagined solely as uh, issues that we can solve technologically without paying attention to kind of root causes to political and economic logics that have produced those problems. Um, and, and, you know, the dynamics between us as organizers that can arise that get in the way of our ability to, to do this work. So, you know, the book really kind of asks well, what makes things run? What is power? What is the nature of power? What is the nature of desire? Um, and what is it that produces these same outcomes over and over again? And what do we have to do to disrupt that repetition to create a transition that is truly and actually just? Um, and I think most importantly, do we even have that kind of agency? What is the nature of agency? Who has it? When? Under what conditions? Um, so these are just a couple of passages that I think highlight some of those aspects of the book. Um, and the first is from a chapter called Algo es Algo. Something is something. The only bright spots that winter are the city council sessions, where Lali sits in the plush auditorium seating of the council chambers with Chela and Naima, keeping an ear cocked for news of the city's legal entanglements with Sizemar. Sometimes checking email, sometimes listening quietly, sometimes snarking in whispers or taking notes. Something is revealing itself, something is coming into view. Lali has not abandoned the student's habit of traveling everywhere with backpacks slung over one shoulder, and in her bag is a spiral notebook where she collects notes and thoughts and even poems, notas, she calls them, feeling form emerge from non-form, the shape of an argument rising in relief against the chaos of observation, something that would explain the how and the why of it, shining a light on what they need to do. These moments of clarity appear between long bouts of boredom, Although sometimes there are moments of levity too. Once Jella burst into the meeting late and unknowingly seated herself one row up from Butch Keller of Keller and Keller, the most powerful developer lobbyist in town and thus the legal representative of Sizemar Explorations LLC. <coughs> that man gets whatever he wants, Sister Soli had warned Chella long ago. I should know, I ran, for his, I ran against his father for mayor. You see him involved? you know something's up. And now there he was behind unsuspecting Chela. Lali had to rip a ribbon of paper from her spiral and dash a quick note, twisting over the back of her seat to pass it back to Chela. Psst, did you know Keller from Keller, Keller and Keller, i.e. KKK is sitting right behind you? Chela had glanced back sur surreptitiously, pretending to look out the window, then dipped her head to write back. I'll be sure to fart extra hard then. Yeah, it felt good to go to the meetings as gutter punk as possible. Brawless and menstruating, dirty stinky chucks with no socks and flapping soles, legs hairy and armpits funky as hell. Then there was the time the representative of a rare earth trade group, the United Rare Earth Association or Urea, lobbied the council in support of domestic rare earth production. Lali and Shella and Naima had passed Lali's notebook between them, furiously scribbling acronyms for a citizen's lobby that might oppose urea. The People's Organization of Ore Opposition, PU. Citizens Against Corrupt Assholes, CACA. Demonstrating intense, agitated resistance without existing alternatives, diarrhea. And then there was the time they played hangman on a day when they'd been sitting in the council chamber since nine in the morning, waiting for their agenda item to come up. Apparently, it'd been pushed back since Mayor Mike was running late in that morning on a red eye from a Spurs game in Mexico City the night before. Items had gotten pushed back, items had gotten jumbled around. So they waited, and as they waited, they played hangman, heads huddled together. Fuck this shit, 
was Naima's secret phrase, which Chela easily solved before Stickman hung. Let's get high, was Chela's offering. Lollies had stumped them. Poopity, whoopity, flushity, washity, plop, plop, plop? Chella had whispered slowly as the puzzle finally revealed itself. What's with you and shit, she said, shaking her head. They'd played on, snickering and snorting like middle school malcriadas. And when the mayor arrived with face flushed, he flashed them ojo from his seat at the dais, making them shake even harder with silent laughter, eyes streaming. Today, they have come to the meeting to hear the city attorney update the council on the status of investigations into what Sizemar knew about the cost discrepancy and when they knew it. And so they are caught off guard by the 20 or 30 people who file up the chamber aisle to excoriate the city for voting the previous week to sharply increase their, elect their electric rates. A rate hike last week, Naima gasps. Did y'all hear anything about a 15% rate hike they passed last week? Nah, said Chella. Mm-mm, says Lali. Naima leans forward to fold her arms on the seat in front of her, chin resting on top, as the elder members of Vamos approach the podium one by one. Damn, that's some serious shit in this weather. Shh, oye mama, trying to hear what he's saying, says Chella. The old man at the podium, flanked by a squadron of viejitas, looks worn and disheveled in a rumpled suit that swims on his slight frame but his voice is firm and practiced. City, power, and light, he is saying. The utility that is supposed to belong to the city, to the people, have the nerve to approach you behind everyone's back for a rate increase? You trust their CEO on this after all the sneaking around on the Sizemore project? What's more, you borrowed a trick from their playbook and actually gave it to them behind everyone's back, and bills are already rising. Just think back to last winter, last summer. We can't even keep our houses livable when it's hot or cold outside. Meanwhile, big companies like Sizemar and the developer of those smokestack condos are getting tax breaks and fee waivers left and right from the city while our homes fall apart from not having the money to fix them. At the very least, you should have waited till you were out of your legal mess. At the bare minimum, you should have had CPL release a line item budget showing what they want all that money for but we are not asking for the bare minimum. We're telling you no, no rate hike, no means no. And if we have to, we'll recall it. Behind him, the viajitas cheer. Chela stands and emits a wolf whistle. Ah, Chela, mumbles Naima, embarrassed but proud. You wanna get us kicked out of here? Chela ignores her. We gotta connect with those folks. <sighs> Who, Manuel Martinez, that old brown beret? Naima clucks her tongue. He's okay, I guess, if you like being elbowed out of the way so he can jump in front of the mic. Everyone knows it's the women in Vamos who do all the work. So then the next, um, the next chapter, little segment that I wanna read is um, uh, the character Lali had mentioned, you know, that she's taking these notes, right? She's, she's making these notas as she observes what's happening in the city uh, to make sense of everything. And then this, is, this chapter is one of those notas called instructions. And it's kind of intended to be like, um, it's, it's as though she had done an interview with somebody and then written down the notes as a poem. So it's written in poem format. So notas for instructions. As dictated to me by Doña Maria Elena, La mera, mera vieja vamos, as she pushes us out the door with armfuls of pens and petitions, clipboards and maps. One, first contact. First, you make first contact. This is straightforward. You show up where people go to pay light bills that have gone overdue or to plead disconnection notices. You go there because they'll have rates on the brain already. And you position yourself along an unavoidable line of their exit from the building. Don't bother them as they go in, they're busy, and don't bother asking for official permission. Security's used to us by now anyway. When we first started coming, they tried to shake their brooms at us, and we told them, look, the sidewalks belong to everyone, so you can't run us off. It's a public space, and we belong here. We're the public. Ha, they didn't expect the ajitas to know their rights of public assembly but we had been trained by the best. That's what the organizer from the Industrial Areas Foundation up north, Chicago, I think he was from, Raul, told us many years ago we should say. 
Stick to the sidewalks and the public spaces with your ironing boards y todo, and you'll be fine, he said. I guess you know something. Because our other great idea was to make something up. Tell them we're promoting that new program CPL has, the one with the thermometers as if we're estupidas. Of course we are not. We are actually going to the root of the thing, hacia las raíces, all the way down to crank the wrench to stop the thing cold in its tracks. So mijitas, grab them as they come out of the building. Don't be afraid to approach your own people, to talk unsolicited. I promise you'll be surprised by what you find. I, I promise you'll be surprised by what you learn about what nuestra gente are going through. That's the reason you're there, por gente. So don't be scared. Two, no tiene miedo. Of course, some will say no or brush you off. That's inevitable. Some will be hurrying home to make dinner or take a shower before work, take care of babies or elderly parents. Some just plain aren't interested. That's okay. Don't be scared of rejection. And another thing, never ask them if they have a minute or if they want to sign a petition. It's too easy to say no. And besides, the truth is more interesting anyway. Say, you're with a community group and you're fighting the rate hikes council passed and you don't like the way they're transitioning, jacking up the rates on los pobres so los ricos can keep their solar powered ACs on full blast all summer so companies like Sizemar can get their fat contracts and get out. They don't mean to, the city, but that's the model. They don't have the imagination to come up with anything better. So what you're doing today is you have a short survey and what you wanna know is how much they pay average for lights and gas. And how much is that compared to their income? And did they ever get their lights cut? And did they even know the rates went up? Don't ask them if they have a minute. Tell them, it'll just take a minute. You'd be surprised how many people are willing to help. You'd be surprised at how natural and normal it feels to ask your neighbor a question. Three, their lives already connect the dots. Well, here's the thing. The survey is a tool. Sure, we want the information, but really it's to get them thinking on the right track, ¿me entiendes? Because when it comes time to ask if they'll sign, you want them to connect it to their everyday lives. The survey is how you do it. Like when you get to the question about whether they knew the rates went up, most will say no. Can you believe that? And that's when you ask them if they want to sign the petition. See that? That's how it works. Now, some will want to take the sheet home to think it over. They'll say, that never works. You'll never get the thing back. The goal is to get them right there. The goal is to refuse to let them refuse, but without manipulation. No, the goal is to inspire a yes, inflame a desire para animar. That's why they call us animadoras. With the survey, you won't need to do explain, no explaining why. No explaining, ha. They'll explain it to themselves. Their own lives will. Four, of course the process isn't fair. Pero here is lo más importante. First, you will need to make sure they're registered voters. If they're not registered, no problem. You sign them up on the spot. We got you deputized, remember? That's why. Second, is they have to sign with the address they registered under, not where they currently live. That's where the city tries to trip you. That's where they'll try to throw out signatures. Who the hell remembers where they registered to vote? We've seen it before, decades back, when we were fighting the unfair budget allocations for streets and drainage. They wanted to give this, each district the same amount. It's only fair, they said. Starve the west side for, de for decades, then give everyone the same to fix it? No, ma'am. So we fought it, but that's how we learned how sneaky they are. We got 50,000 signatures, which back then was a lot. 50,000 signatures, which they threw out half saying the people weren't really registered to vote because of the address thing. And whatever little way we tried to maneuver within the system, the system would find a way to block us. If it wasn't throwing out signatures, it was we used the wrong form or we wrote in the wrong color pen. Whatever they had to do, any little gap or crack, they'd wriggle right in and they'd get you. That's how we learn the process isn't fair. I think a lot of us going in believe the system would protect us. That is what we had been taught to believe. When we learned it wasn't like that, our little light bulbs went off, ding, ding, ding. We lowered our expectations and it was like, okay. So now we know we're gonna have to be sneaky on top of dignified. 
we're going to have to do double duty, both inside, outside and in. It's the same now as then, more than 40 years later. Not much has changed, except now it's our own people doing it. Like I said, no imagination, just more of the same, more of the same. Why do you think we're called vamos anyway? We're viejas against more of the same. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marisol. Um, it's beautiful to hear those things and the reality of it, it's, it, it's hit so much to, to close and um, to home and like, yeah, sitting, sitting for hours and hours at City Hall. Yeah, <laughs> everything goes through your mind. <laughs> yep. uh, but you could, you could order um, Loose at Midnight from Flower Song Press. Um, and if there's any links like that, um, feel free to drop them in the, in the chat. Let's give a big um, round of applause to Mari, Marisol Cortez um, for this book. And it's, it's beautiful and hilarious. <laughs> I love it. Um, and so we'll, we'll be moving um, through to the next piece. Um, so this is uh, pivoting from a lot of the like technical pieces and policy pieces. Um, into um, a section that is around like creative and community solutions. And so this is the last, um, one of the last sections and I think one of the most important ones as we um, move into, into sort of our last hour together. And so we are joined by Carrie Fulton from um, the Climate Justice Alliance, who's been working on around um, the regenerative economy. And so I see that, that you are online, Carrie. Um, and so this, this piece is really sort of what's been happening in the, on the grounds, what's been moving um, here on the day-to-day -day, um, pieces where um, having a lot of deeper conversations of, of what does it mean when we are, um, within um, climate disasters and um, what happens on the ground that first day, right? And so I, I think one similar um, effect was when um, COVID-19 hit earlier this year and many people turned into different spaces around what is a solution? How do we keep our people safe? Um, developing different systems on the ground um, so that they're able to get what they needed to get done to their community, right? And I think a lot of that happened outside of a government structure. Um, some of it also happens outside of like an institutional space or a nonprofit. Um, and, and I think having a lot of these conversations of like, what are the different pieces that happens both logistically and how do we move forward towards creating this frame of, of um, we've done this work, we have the solutions, we have these ideas, how do we get it into action? Um, and how do we do it in a way um, where we're um, not following the, the same systems that got us here in the first place, right? And so I'm, I'm glad to welcome Carrie. We met years and years ago um, through many different movements and I'm glad to, to see your face again um, leading this work because I have full faith that um, you have the thought, you have the vision, um, and I love um, just being in the same spaces with you as you bring in a lot of these different um, pieces. So uh, for the next 15 minutes or so, we'll be hearing a little bit about you and sort of what's the work that's been happening on the ground, um, you know, all the way from, um, from, are you in, I believe you're in Baltimore. You're, yeah, um, you're all the way from Baltimore work, working with Climate Justice Alliance, which, which is a national um, group of different grassroots organizations, which SWU is part of as well. Um, and so I welcome to, um, let's welcome Carrie. Um, and feel free to drop in the chat if you have questions, comments, you're in agreement, you know, we love all the reactions that you could provide us right now. Hi, y'all. How you doing? It's really good to see Diana and Marisol and to hear your work. It's been a minute. It's been a long minute. Last time, I think we were in Hondo and I came down um, and it was beautiful and south. And that was my first time to go into San Antonio as well. And everything in Texas really is bigger. I wasn't prepared 
for that, but it really is. And uh, that's a beautiful thing. Um, I do want to thank you all for having me um, and for making space for this conversation around the regenerative economy. Um, this Has anybody ever heard that term before? Yes, maybe so. What, what about you, Tony? What have you heard of this term before? Cool. Oh, you're on mute, sorry. All right, I think I got it. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, uh, well, as I understand it, um, it's uh, regenerative because it's uh, self-perpetuating in some sense, uh, sustainable, I guess, would be another uh, word that I would attach, although it's, you know, kind of out of favor now, but uh, the idea that it's, uh, it's more natural. Exactly. The idea of a regenerative economy is one that's based, like you said, not on a finite source of power as we look at how our society is built right now when we think about oil and coal and these finite sources of energy that we base our whole economy around. Um, and there's this issue of how we look at economics in general, where under traditional American Western economic systems, there's always somebody at the margins. There's always someone on these scales that gets left um, to the wayside. And that's supposed to just be okay. There is this idea that, um, well, everybody might not be able to meet that, that price, that equilibrium price, right? But that's okay, they'll figure it out. And we're supposed to create like maybe safety nets that are not really permanent safety nets. As we look at our society right now, we see how fragile our safety nets can be, whether that's looking at social security or looking at affordable housing or looking at access to healthcare. Those are all considered safety nets and they are not necessarily something that we are guaranteed in this country. Under the idea of a regenerative economy, it's more than just saying we want to have clean, renewable energy. It's also about saying we want to make sure that the edges are abundant. We want to make sure that our, um, not just our economy, but our ecosystem, we realize that it is a living being. It is something that is growing. It is something that has to be nourished in all parts in order for it to be abundant. So if you're looking at the idea of a of an ecosystem as a plant, as a tree, you have roots, right? And you have leaves. And if the system is not properly being fed, right? It shows up in those leaves, right? The leaves get a little drier, the plant starts to dry out, and the whole system starts to crush, and then the whole plant dies. So under the idea of a regenerative economy, it's saying that no, in order for this to thrive, we have to make sure that this whole plant is properly nourished, this whole plant, this whole planet. So this summer, the Climate Justice Alliance partnered with about 15 other different organizations to create the people's orientation to a regenerative economy. And for the most part, a lot of the data, a lot of the research, if you ever Google regenerative economy and regenerative economics, it comes from um, a school of thought that is definitely not necessarily diverse. When you look at who's writing and who's getting the um, credits, and who's doing the academic ideology around this idea. So it was important that we put a people's lens on this radical idea of a regenerative economy, of saying that we want to have an economy that
that is based on renewable energy and clean renewable energy, but we also want it to be just for all people. We also want to make sure, and we know that everybody in the system is not necessarily going to be equal, but that doesn't mean that people should not thrive. And we can build a system where people thrive, right? So that was the idea between, behind the people's orientation to a regenerative economy, was to get our framework out, to say what does it actually mean to thrive? What does it actually mean to build this regenerative economy? So I'm gonna drop this link here for the climate justice slides. And this was also done with groups like People's Action, IEN, uh, Grassroots Global Justice is also a member of the United Frontline Table as well as a number of other groups. Well, let me drop this in the chat. And under our framework of a regenerative economy, we have 14 planks. And these 14 planks um, include energy democracy, climate justice, justice for black lives and communities, indigenous, so indigenous and tribal sovereignty. And how we came up with some of these ideas comes from uh, different meetings, including with groups like Southwest Workers Union, and other groups who came up and said, this is how we see it. This is how we envision it. Um, and part of it also includes how we see what our organizing flows like. What does this actually mean? I don't know, I apologize. I don't know if it's possible to share my screen at all. Um, but I did want to show this image, if at all possible. You look at the bottom of your screen. Oh, I can share. Awesome. Fabuloso. So I'm just going to show this real quick. You see the little girl? Where did she go? She disappeared. But this is the site and the different planks. And this is how we kind of, the framework of how we see a regenerative economy and how it's built. So of course, base building, the organizing is the water that fuels um, the movement. And the narrative is the seeds it's how we drop down, we put the narrative in. This is how we're telling our story from these narratives, from our narratives, from the people's narratives. We put the water to feed that. And then it grows and into policy development. And then from policy development, it can go into implementation and electoralization, into making sure that we have the right people in office. And then from there, it goes into direct action as well, who helped to make all of this happen. If you look around, you can kind of see the farmers and stewards, all of this, they play a major role in making sure that this movement towards a regenerative economy um, comes into fruition. Now, our work at the Climate Justice Alliance is critical because the way that we see a regenerative economy, I'm gonna stop share real quick, as the United Frontline Table, because it's 16 different organizations, is a little different because it's not just about climate, it's about all these other pieces that make an economy important, right? But the Climate Justice Alliance, we know that it's critical to have expert voices and we are a coalition of 72 different organizations, SWU being a part of that, who are working towards making sure that when we build this, we have something better. So we don't wanna have a lot of false solutions um, 
and geoengineering, which is something that's really, really popping up and really, really big. Even looking at the two candidates that we have for president right now, there's conversation around who's gonna frack more, right? Um, and who's gonna do that? And so we know that it's important to have a heavy hand on making sure that we're fighting back against false solutions. And we also know that those false solutions happen in our communities first and worst. And one of the powerful things, I think even going back um, years ago with Diana is we would sit in a room and we'd have people from Chester, Pennsylvania, and we'd have people from San Antonio, and we'd have people from First Nation lands in Canada, and they would be dealing with the same contaminating corporations, the same issues, the same struggles. So what is so important about building an alliance and building a regenerative economy is remembering that we're not alone. And a lot of times in our systems that we're in right now, because we're dealing with this idea of finite resources, because we're always told there's never enough. And if you want it, you gotta work harder than the rest and there's always somebody that's gonna take it out. We stop seeing ourselves as truly members in solidarity with one another. We're humans working together with one another. And that's the importance of building our alliances. And that's the importance of building it around a framework that has something that's bigger. We're not just saying there's a problem, we're saying this is how we can get to a solution. And that's what we're building today. And we wanna do this not alone. We don't wanna do this in a silo. We don't wanna cancel our way out of finding solidarity and strength amongst people who see that there's a possibility to make a difference. Um, and so that's why we do what we do. Um, is it easy? No, it's not easy. It, the first step is even getting people to understand the concept of a regenerative economy. And I'm happy to answer any questions you all might have. Um, I just finished grad school at Georgetown, which was exciting, but my capstone was um, mainly about regenerative economics. So I did a deep nerd dive on this topic and I believe in it um, full force. I think it's really critical and important. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to answer. Yay, nerd dives, yes. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and I thank y'all for listening and for having me here with y'all. Thank you, Carrie, for breaking that down and for sharing a lot of some of this background as we as we move through it, right? As you said, that there's there's a lot of solutions that that we do have, um, and you know, having you know everybody here from these different spaces um, and what's happening at a national level um, is definitely uh, continuing to be part of what um, what moves here at the local level as well. Um, we have a, a before we get into the, the questions piece and the answers piece, um, make sure to drop them down in the chat and we're gonna um, move uh, to watching a short video um, around some of the pieces and solutions that people have been um, working on this past, um, these past few uh, months around uh, mutual aid, around um, ensuring that that people who um, are historically left out um, are included and organizations doing that work to make sure that they are bringing in their communities and supporting them in that way. So in this, in this video, we're gonna hear from Giovanna Lopez, from, from Ecocentro, from uh, Candy Diaz, from Hidden Heart, um, Emma Diaz and Eric Fierro from the care team at American Indians of Texas. And so those are just some of the um, some, some of the faces you'll see in this one, and then we'll, we'll then have a deeper conversation around food and food policy um, as, as we move forward into our next, um, our next speakers.
A lot of these organizations are reaching a lot of those people that are unable to um, get to this specific space. Yeah. Um, there's a community, uh, there's actually an organization called Sueños Sin Fronteras that right. has been helping undocumented uh, families that have crossed the border and have just done uh, their time in ICE. I mean, there's an Afghani community that we've helped. Yeah. Um, it's, of course, black and brown communities, as you can see here, coming through to pick up boxes for yeah. their organizations or their families. Yeah. Um, there's just so many different uh, und uh, undocumented yeah. families that are being served. Um, it's a lot of people that are falling through the cracks through the, the food bank yeah. Um, yeah. stuff, because I know the food bank is doing what they can, but they are not reaching everybody, and it's mm -hmm. just almost impossible. So mm -hmm. that's where people like us come into play, you know, where we try to help fill in those those gaps. At 410 Roosevelt, there's a little neighborhood yeah. there, uh, you know, it needs a lot of help. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know, something just clicked in me and, and, you know, I started this organization to help, you know, this, I started with just seniors, but during the pandemic, uh -huh. um, there was, we realized that there were a lot of families in need and a lot of families with children. Yeah. So we're, you know, delivering these boxes to those families. My whole thing was just getting resources for seniors, but it's turned into so much bigger. And I've got about 20 volunteers that anything that we need to do, they come in, uh, they're, they're waiting for us now to, you know, load up and go and distribute to each street so that we make sure that everybody, you know, it has food. Uh, we have South Workers Union. We have the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center. Um, we have AIT. Mm -hmm. We just, uh, kind of had to make something out of scratch. Yeah, yeah we've yeah. done about a Over thousand, a thousand families. deliveries. Um, in addition to doing these distributions for the boxes, uh, we made care packages, which uh, contain uh, personal protection equipment, hand sanitizer, masks, toilet paper. Yeah. They're probably already struggling before COVID, right. but the impacts of COVID made it even more necessary um, for a project like this. Um, people lost their jobs, people yeah. are disabled, they have a bunch of kids at school. I mean, who are not in school right now, they're at home. We ended up partnering with Giovanna. Um, we started out volunteering at the garden, helping uh, the Garcia Street Farm. Um, then I guess when this initiative took off, she asked us if we were willing to pick up boxes to distribute to the community. And yeah. you know, since we're already doing deliveries, we jumped on that. It seemed like the perfect, yeah. you know, hand in hand. You can't depend uh, on on people to call you. You've got to go out there and do it. First of all, second. You know, you've got to be in that community and work with the community in order to find out what they need. You can send, a, you know, resources into a community, but if nobody knows about it, that's, you know, nobody's going to get them. So having somebody in there and working together with the Neighborhood Association, working along with the church and the park, we've all come together and said, hey, we need to work on this, and this is where we're at. Awesome, and and um, that was a kind of a great on the ground. That was that was just last week. Greg went out and um, met a lot of people um, in to have this conversation and to bring them as part of a, a recovery, a just recovery uh, framework that we're talking about. Because many organizations that are both work working on some of these issues um, are also doing many of the mutual aid work right now. And so instead of seeing it as two different pieces, we, um, we need to reach um, those multiple aspects of where, where the people's needs are right now. Um, in this next conversation, we want to bring in a specific conversation around the food, which is deeply connected to um, when we talk about um, economy, when we talk about jobs, um, when we talk about some of these different pieces, we see the reality of what does it mean to have and to include um, job, jobs around um, farming, around urban ag, around food policy within this space in a, in a place like San Antonio that doesn't historically see that as, as a, a large value um, in that work. And so I think that that's something that these next um, three folks, Giovanna Lopez, Beth Keel, and Cecile Parrish, um, are really bringing in some, some of these spaces to have deeper conversations around food policy, food access, but also, you know, talking about labor and jobs. Um, and let me, let's just make sure logistically we all, we're all there. I was too busy looking at the video to see the participants. Okay, we have Giovanna on. Um, we have Beth on and 
Cecile, I don't see Cecile on, but we'll start with, with Giovanna. And for these next 10 minutes, um, we have three speakers. Um, and so um, I'd say like two to three minutes um, each so that we're able to have a full discussion around that. So um, in the order of um, Giovanna Lopez, Beth Kiel, and Cecile Parrish. Hi, how's everyone? <laughs> um, actually, I'm not sure Cecile knew she had to be on this phone call. We're actually meeting up with each other right now to pick up straw. <laughs> like the job of farming never ends, urban farming. Um, hello, thank you so much for having me. Um, and you know, the other people in the community that we're working with, it, it's been an exhausting um, experience, but also humbling to be able to, to help a lot of people that wouldn't normally get the help from the food bank that you know that that uh that kind of fall through the cracks and you know COVID really really brought that to light i mean we already all knew that there was a a food insecurity issue in san antonio it just became exacerbated when COVID hit um the boxes were originally the way we started the boxes where we were just kind of fundraising money asking people for money and we would go over to the produce wholesalers and we would try to haggle and figure out a way um, to get a box at the most affordable rate. And so they would give them to us a few bucks cheaper than they did to the public. Um, it was still a really big expense. And um, all of a sudden, Beth Keel connected me with somebody at Damari Fresh who um, had just gotten the uh, Farmers to Families grant. And with that, we were able to, um, at first, I think in June is when we started, we were able to get three trucks a week. And so we were serving the east, the west side, and then we had a central location at Eco Centro that um, was able to serve a bunch of different communities. And like I said, the Afghani community that we'd been serving on the north side um, was in great need. You know, they're one of, they're one of the most at need um, communities right now, refugee communities. Um, alongside the undocumented community. And so um, what was great about us coming together is that we were able to connect to a lot of community leaders that were able to um, chime in to those communities to see what they needed. And a lot of these partners did a lot of the other work for us because they were able to fill a lot more nutritious things in these boxes because these boxes were not diabetic friendly. Um, Okay, nobody's around. I can put my mask down for a minute. <laughs> uh, they are not diabetic friendly. And so that was one of the issues, you know, they're free and that's great, but we also wanted to make sure that these boxes were able to be um, supplemented in a way that could serve the communities that were dealing with, you know, high diabetes rates. So I know that uh, AIT and the Brown Berets, the uh, autonomous Brown Berets uh, supplemented their boxes on a few, um, I'm sorry, on a few occasions. And I know there are other organizations that we have been working with like SWU that had been supplementing uh, greens and other vegetables into the boxes just to kind of offset um, the, the fact that there were a lot of things that would trigger someone that had diabetes. Um, and so now we are receiving between, I think five to 10 trucks a week. Now through Damari, we are able to serve um, more communities as well as feed more of the people that people uh, in the organizations that we were already um, serving. So um, I think to date we are close to just a little bit over 200,000 people that we've served since June, um, if we're going to count those boxes. Um, and it's, the need doesn't end. I, I think that even after COVID, th there's going to be a lot of repercussions for um, what this pandemic has done, especially to the working class, to undocumented um, communities, to people that are working in the fields, um, in the factories. Um, I know that that's been a really big issue um, with getting these boxes out is that they don't have enough help in these warehouses to fill these boxes. And it, a lot of it has to do with COVID. Um, a lot of it has to do with people that are getting sent back to their country. And so there's just so many different layers to the onion. Um, in this scenario and so we you know we have been really um grateful to the community at large for for really coming together and supporting this and being able to feed people that probably wouldn't be able to to get commodities because they don't have documentation or they don't have you know transportation that's 
That's awesome, Giovanna. Do you mind? Uh, I just wanted to, um, for, for Beth Keel, um, we were talking yesterday or earlier this week um, about um, the work, and I meant to set this up at the top of the conversation really, is that this, you know, the food policy, and this is like, and I don't know if, if, if maybe they're free to say it as strong as I feel it, but I think I understand what was happening is that, you know, we had a group of people organized in the community who had a great vision, you know, that said, you know, it's, we can't get food, healthy food, food next door in our neighborhoods to people. Uh, and went to the city with these very specific proposals, ways we can do it, ways that, you know, right now, as I understand it, like the Unified Uniform Development Code is very developer driven, that it can take tens of thousands of dollars to try to get a, an empty lot platted so somebody can grow greens for their neighborhood, you know, and uh, and nobody, the, the mayor and the, and, the, and the past council, nobody had time to hear that or wasn't, you know, uh, willing to, to listen. And now that COVID's hit, right? Uh, and what's happened? We've seen, uh, like, like uh, Giovanna was just saying, the Food Network broke down. We see in, 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 in these, these horrible photos of like miles and miles and miles of cars trying to get food from the food bank. It's just a total breakdown. Uh, and so now they're willing to listen. And so I would love it if, if Beth is on and able to speak to that, the work of policy setting, because really what we're all here thinking about is like, we have these values, we know what's right, we know things that are broken and, and how to fix them. And together we can come up with great solutions, but there comes a point where moving it into policy. And why I love that regenerative graphic, you know, it's like, it makes it seem much more calm to be able to get those seeds down and get that water down and get that sunflower growing up. I'm like, that looks great. And in the ground sometimes, I think San Antonio, Texas and generally, and, and I, that's why I think um, um, having Carrie here and others here is like, you can, can feel very lonely. I think San Antonio feels that way for, for organizers and activists and stuff. But I don't know if Beth, if you're on, you can talk to the policy side of that or Giovanna, if you want to carry it some more. Um, I just appreciate having you guys here and we'll have a, a broader, com you know, we can just let the conversation run and then we've got one more poet lined up and we can close it out with the flute of uh, Seba Ali after that. Sure, I think uh, Giovanna and I both could talk about the policy side. So, um, wow. So in, I got to San Antonio in 2010, and one of the first things that I noticed was uh, the sheer food insecurity in the city of San Antonio. So I talked to my director at the time about creating an urban farm. Um, I talked to the CEOs, the executive staff, even HUD up in DC about this one thing that's missing. It's not just in our housing authority, but also other housing authorities all across the nation. Um, basically they gave me permission, but I had to start looking for the money. In the, in the meantime of looking for the money, we also noticed that there was a lot of uh, barriers in the Unified Development Code that would prevent us from moving forward with urban farming within the city of San Antonio. So I got hooked up with the Food Policy Council in, I guess, about 2013-14, and we started working with the Development Services, with COSA, and going line for line on how we could allow urban farming in San Antonio by opening up the zoning codes. So we started out with the zoning codes. Uh, Cecile Parrish opened up a farm on the west side through idea schools and I was able to get grant funding to open up an urban farm on the east side. So past five years with Cecile and I being able to open up these urban farms, we started seeing, sorry, my alarm's going off. Um, we started seeing all these other, uh, I would say barriers that entrepreneurs could have if they wanted to start an urban farm. So again, we started the process in changing the unified development codes, trying to make it a little bit more user-friendly, uh, working with the city on creating uh, information sheets so urban farmers could come in and have step-by-step -step guides on exactly what they needed to do in order to start a farm and to get all the permits they need, where to go, what to sign, what to do. And again, there are so many more cogs to this wheel 
than I can even like have time to describe to you, to all of you. It, it's everything from hiring a engineer to do a replatting if you're going to inc like include uh, utilities on your farming side if the farming side doesn't already have previous utilities to being able to know how to write uh, letters to the city to request waivers like fee waivers and a lot of people in San Antonio um, don't necessarily know how to do that so what we're trying to do is make it very easy make it so it's more cost effective and we're hoping that this round of UDC code changes will bring down those barriers a little bit more and we still have our sights set on working with SAWS and CPS to bring down their impact fees. So these are things in motion. They've been going in motion for the past over six years and this is not a fast process. So if anyone wants to change policies, especially if it comes to whether it's local or, or state or national, you have to have patience. And the best thing that I can tell all of you guys is if you have a passion on something or a passion for something and want something to change, you, you start with the seeds, exactly like Greg says. So seeds take up to seven years to germinate. Just imagine that every day you're looking at that little seed giving a little bit of food, a little bit of water, a little bit of sun, and a lot of love. And eventually the things will change. They might not be perfect, but they will change. Joe, you wanna to add to that? Well, Cecile is actually here with me right now. Um, if I can have her speak, I really would like her to speak on this because she's actually the person that, <laughs> besides the food bank that has opened two different urban farms in the city, um, and I just really would like her to speak on it because she's experienced what we're trying to avoid the rest of the community experiencing when it comes to planning and um, getting irrigation and all that. So here she is. Hi, everyone. We are loading hay bales, sorry. Um, so everything that Beth was saying is, is absolutely true. There's a lot of prohibitive aspects of code that are... Um, I don't think they're necessarily malicious, but they just didn't plan any sort of green space code. It's all, especially the pricing and the engineering requirements are very um, seemingly debased, based on developers. And so um, we have been, you know, whittling down our code suggestions, but our main goal is just to make it more uh, or less cost prohibitive. So um, one of the biggest things I see is what Beth discussed is having to replat a property if you're going to add utilities. It's kind of a catch-22 in an urban setting because if you were, like the ideal lot didn't have a building on it, right? But most of them have, and it's standard to remove all meters with demolition. So no matter what, you're going to have to install utilities um, if you want water and there are also building code you know prohibitions I guess that make it challenging to have a large enough roof to do like a rainwater catchment system or some workaround to those utilities um, and then gray water especially from condensate is also uh, on the state level really wonky code wise. So you get really backed into a corner if you're trying to grow or create a really uh, thriving green space um, irrigation wise. And so what we are trying to do because those platting fees um, are really ex intense. I mean, I think for the urban farm that we're now working on, Beth, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was over $20,000 um, just to, just to get the plat. That's not any of the, you know, meter installation or anything else. So um, that's where we have more potential to change. We can't, we can't really address how intensely costly it is to install a water meter because that's with SAWS. But with the code development in particular, we can create what's called a certificate of determination that can be applied for if you are starting a green space and that would bypass the platting fee requirements. So that's, that's the big thing that we're really pushing for um, at this time with the UDC. 
Thank you for breaking all that down. There's definitely a lot of different steps as we move into into figuring out what that what that looks like specifically for San Antonio. Um, and there's a lot of moving different moving pieces from like literally working in the ground to like just setting up utilities and setting up the water systems for for what a, a structure like that needs. Um, and definitely, you know, uh, even just the Food Policy Council, you know, it, 10 years ago, I think it was, you know, barely starting and we were all part of these different spaces um, and seeing it actually building into action and doing a lot of these different pieces has been really good and seeing many farms popping up has been really beautiful um, as an example of what we could do together. Um, and the reality that it takes multiple people working towards the same vision using different strategies at the same time is what it takes to to move into these pieces and, and so that's actually what's happening right now is we're talking about mutual aid we're talking about policy we're talking about um even just framework and funding um around how do we actually get money on the ground to do this um and to do this these visioning pieces how do we um not only sustain ourselves off of grants or off of our own money in many cases, um, organizers, but how do we actually get people to invest in, in this work? And so on the ground, as we're moving these pieces, um, you know, the, the defund work here in, in San Antonio was also integrated into, into some of this just recovery pieces around ensuring that investments are made for, for structures in neighborhoods that have been historically, you know, and intentionally um, not invested in for many years because they, you know, they weren't making money for somebody. So they decided to uh, invest money somewhere else. Um, and so I think when we look at all these different pieces, we see that we are moving. Um, and as, as long as we're moving forward in a aligned way, it's, it's important to really also know so sort of the full cycle from, we were talking earlier, we, we you know, dove deep into, um, into energy, right? We dove deep in, into um, our public utility work and how those structures um, are in real need of, of some of the shifts because they're just not working for us. Um, and, and we you know, dove deep into some of the policy pieces and the organizing pieces um, all the way you know, from New Jersey, from Baltimore and all around the US with the Climate Justice Alliance, we're seeing that this work is moving and that people are coming to the reality that um, that right now we are in need to, to shift and change and do something on the ground that needs to work while working in, in agreement and in alignment um, nationally and locally. Um, and while we're not always in the same spaces, um, being able to have, you know, 40 people on a call, 20 people on a call is definitely an important part of this work. Um, we have uh, uh, some last few pieces and we are also running out of time. So I wanna both respect the discussion and um, uh, a lot of the artistic creative pieces that, that we bring and that sustain us um, sometimes to kind of just process and bring in some of this work. So I, I um, th think we have another video left and a poem um, and then we are, uh, closing off for any any closing uh, remarks. And you know, feel feel free. We might not be able to to say everything, but feel free to drop drop things in the chat um, in agreement and in support. If we could um, go ahead and do the poem first, and we will end um, with video, if that's okay. Okay, yeah, um, we want to invite and bring up Alicia uh, Zavala Galvan to share um, a poem. And I have you on mute right now. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, it's been um, eye-opening this afternoon. The discussion I didn't hear, wasn't here the first time, the whole time. My apologies. Um, 
I want to thank Sierra Club for all the work that they're doing, collaboration with all these organizations that I didn't know was going on. Um, I was invited here by Zan, and uh, I want to thank her too. We are part of the poetry group Voces Cosmica. Um, I will be run one poem, and um, and we'll start on it. The title is Circles of Pollution and Contamination, Will the Cycle Never End? Its mouth is caught in our fishing hook. We see it struggle in its last seconds of life and try to make its death swift and painless. Taking it quickly to the prepared open air fire, anxious to eat its delicious moist flesh, picking up a sharp knife to slit open its center, exposing its source of life and find bits of plastic that it had been trying to digest in vain as food. Our appetite disappears, choosing instead to bury it so what it will be absorbed and nourish the earth, except for those bits of plastic that perhaps will be found many years from now. That's the grim reality of, unfortunately, today's um, air, the pollution everywhere. And I think the, the, if we can just do one pit of ourselves, because it's not just us, but the, the, the children that will be here. They are coming they're already here, and we have to teach them that. Thank you very much, Diane. Thank you, Alicia, um, for sharing that with us and for reflecting on today as well. Um, definitely glad to be able to have you on for, for a few minutes. Thank you. Are we ready for um, the video? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, this is the um, flute music from Seba V and I think we'll kind of conclude with that unless folks wanted time to discuss or have, I don't know, I missed a lot, my computer crashed, so I don't know if there was a questions uh, that folks still had or we wanted to, to rap. This is kind of a rap song. And I just want to note for everyone that the chat will be saved, um, so we will be um, directing some of those questions to some of the folks on the call and of course reach out to Greg, Diana, or me um, if you have any questions or want to see anything. We also have bios that will be sent out to folks um, for who was talking today. And I'll go ahead and play the video. Thank you all for attending and being here, being present and sharing ideas, solutions, conversations. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, thanks. Thank you, everyone.
Gracias, Seba, Ili, for sharing that work and who's also supported this um, event with translation, translation of materials um, that went out for this and the flyer. Um, yeah, I, I am definitely, there's a lot to process and reflect and on a weekly basis, you know, we're, we're moving stuff. And so if you want to participate, definitely reach out to any of us on this call. Greg um, will uh, be sending out some, some of the information for all the speakers today and for um, any of the ongoing work that's happening. Um, should we okay. unmute folks um, and kind of just say if they wanted to say anything, um, their goodbyes <laughs> um, as we continue to have some of these conversations. Just anybody who would like to step in. I think folks can, yeah. Thank you all for having me. Thank this is really, really awesome. Um, thank you, Greg. Thank you, Sierra Club. Thank you, Swoo. Thank you to all the awesome organizers that I may not have mentioned. I apologize for that. Thank you for the poems, for the readings, the beautiful videos, and everything that was said. Uh, Diana, hope to see you in real form soon. <laughs> and thank you for everything. This was beautiful. And it was good to learn more about what y'all are doing in San Antonio. Thank you, Kari. I want to thank everyone too, because uh, it's very encouraging to see um, the surfacing of life in the new generation coming forward to meet the real challenges and the major changes that are taking place, not only in our society, but around the world that are almost inconceivable to people for them to address in the old structures and new structures are being created that will empower us to bring forth the gifts that are needed for the next generation to continue life on the planet. So thank you all very much. Thank you all very much for, for everything. Uh, in particular, uh, Greg, thank you for once again providing a channel uh, during this time of COVID to, to keep us rooted. Uh, it's been a difficult time and it continues to be so, but uh, uh, these opportunities remind us that, you know, there's hope and there's, there's uh, solidarity and uh, and help us push push through these difficult times. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you, Tony. It's good to see your face. Good to see you here and healthy. Um, Hannah, did you want to come in? Hannah is someone I just met. Um, I mentioned at the top of the call who had been working or is has been working in the as an ICU nurse. Um, and is uh, studying, working on her PhD, and uh, interested in these intersections, interested in sees environmental justice playing out in the hospital, uh, and uh, sees climate change as deeply connected. So I don't know, um, if you're there, can unmute. Welcome and say hi, hello Greg. to everyone. Yeah, yeah. hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for letting me speak. I'll keep it quick. Um, so like Greg said, I'm Hannah. I'm a San Antonio native and a critical care nurse. Uh, right now I'm studying to become a family nurse practitioner and recently I've been uh, researching air pollution's effect on health here in San Antonio and um, I'm hoping to focus my research on climate change's effect on health um, of underserved communities. Um, right now I, I've been working in the COVID ICU uh, during our outbreak in San Antonio and it's been a really difficult year um, in my career and personal life. Um, like many of you, I've lost family members to COVID-19 and as a healthcare provider, um, I've struggled with the barriers the pandemic has put between my patients and I. Um, covered in protective gear, it felt impossible to connect with my patients, um, unable to hold their hand and unable to embrace their family members like I have um, before. It's really been the worst. Um, so even before the pandemic, health disparities in San Antonio and our nation um, have been undeniable. Um, 
the pandemic's just further proof that during times of crisis, um, our black and brown communities are disproportionately affected. Unfortunately, our healthcare system in the US has always been reactive uh, rather than preventative. In the hospital, especially in the ICU, we often intervene when permanent damage has already been done. I've seen that our mindset, um, our mindset has been similar throughout the pandemic and also when addressing climate change. So uh, I think this year has made it wildly apparent that environmental health, access to healthcare, food security, housing security, and social injustice are all interconnected. Um, so I, I just wanna, um, I guess, go over these, these points that I think have become more apparent, um, always present, but more apparent this year. Um, racial and social inequities exist and they need to be addressed. Uh, science and research have the capability to save lives. Acting in a timely manner is crucial. And uh, finally, collectively, our voices have the potential to bring about real change. Um, unfortunately, we can't go back in time and change the outcomes we've seen thus far from the pandemic. We're still facing an uphill battle. Um, however, I think we can take this experience and learn from it and apply it to other pressing public health issues, such as climate change, which will exacerbate all these issues we've been discussing um, the past few hours. I hope that as a community, we continue to take strides towards our goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2050 with social equity um, or social justice and equity at the center of our actions. So um, hearing everyone speak has been really inspiring. Um, I know it can kind of feel, or for me anyway, that you know, no one around me is really talking about these issues. Um, so it's great to be part of this uh, community and have this channel to discuss these issues. Uh, really appreciate your words, the work that you're doing, and um, hope you're able to stay well and stay safe. And yeah, we're all in it together. And some of us are bearing more risk than others, for sure. Um, so thank you for that. I don't know if there's anybody else that comments or questions or introductions, um, but thank you for being here, Anna. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think, um, thank you so much, everybody, for sharing, for participating, for sticking with us for three hours, <laughs> go through, like, basically all the different issues that we have going on, um, and kind of just have it all in one place. <laughs> so um, I think that's definitely the way we, we see things as well, and really glad to, to be able to have these deeper conversations with y'all and process a lot of this work, and then you know, come up with um, and continue to do all the really awesome stuff that is going on. A reminder that folks doing the uh, SAWS and CPS petitions are out um, during in early voting locations right now. Um, and they're, they're pushing through. Uh, they're out there for almost 10, 12 hours a day in different shifts. Um, and if you have time and you haven't gone to vote and um, please um, do so at that time. And um, but I know the one place that folks are at are the Lions Field um, and the at and Center. So if you haven't, you know, go visit the folks there. I'm sure they'll really appreciate talking to, to people. Um, and once again, just, just thank you all. I had a, I had a great time um, ha having a lot of these conversations with both Greg and Meredith who kind of helped out with uh, developing this day and thinking through all the different troubleshootings and the different sections so that we're make, making sure that we're being intersectional, we're diving deep, we're diving broad, um, and we're bringing it all together down to what's happening here in San Antonio. All right. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Sunday. <laughs> yes. Yes, thank you.